And welcome everybody to the Gym Masters Show Live. How are all of you? We say good evening to our friends who are watching in Ireland, England, Scotland, and other parts of the Greenwich Mean Time. And uh, I believe it's, uh, what is it, still morning time in Australia and New Zealand. We welcome our friends in Asia and, of course, everybody here in the United States and Canada, where it is 3 p.m. Eastern here at our broadcast center which actually is our home studio. <laughs> we are here in the Northeastern United States of America between uh, New York and Boston along the Southern New England coast. And we toast all of you. I'm your host, Jim Masters. We welcome you and you and you and you. We've got a nice afternoon cup of Java, some nice warm coffee, and it'll probably be cold by the time I finish it. That always happens. So I better take a sip right now. Hmm. You got to get it while it's hot, right? So uh, how is everybody? This is uh, an earlier time than we normally do. We usually broadcast our shows live at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific every single day. Today, we're doing it earlier because our guest is live in London, England. He is a renowned record producer, a real legend in the industry, and owner of... Uh, J Records in London, John Yap is here, and we're very excited to uh, learn about his incredible career and the amazing people he's worked with and some of the fantastic projects that he's doing. Uh, there's this wonderful Digi Mix system that he's created as well to restore some of the greatest works uh, of art when it comes to music. That uh, is something that is exclusive to him and his company. But this is a guy that's been in the record business, uh, music business for decades. He's worked with some of the greatest, not just in England, but worldwide. He's internationally respected, internationally known, and um, highly revered. And he's received lots of awards and accolades for his expertise. But he also is a warm and engaging and affable person. This is why other producers and musicians and singers, performers, writers love working with him and have for decades because of his personality. He likes to collaborate. He likes to create. He likes to uh, envision new ways of doing things. And he's been doing that in restoring master works of incredible music. We're going to be talking about some of that. You'll be able also to go to his website to hear some of the music samples and to, to get some of the music as well. So we've got a great afternoon in store for you or evening or morning, wherever you're watching. If you're watching for the first time, we have done about 230 episodes of the Gym Masters Show Live. I do this work professionally in the real world. I'm a television and radio presenter, personality host, journalist, actor, writer, producer, stage MC, voiceover narrator and voiceover actor, and uh, have done it for a long time myself. And we started this show in the springtime every single day live with guests from all walks of life and fields of endeavor and wealth of success from entertainment, music, television, Broadway, Hollywood, as well as culinary arts, sports, comedy, inspiration, authors, science, health and wellness. This is a traditional entertainment lifestyle talk show series that brings back some of the uh, old sensibilities of talk shows, bringing back the lost art of conversation like talk shows used to do uh, with the modern vibe and cool sensibilities of today. All of our viewers call themselves Lovities, so you'll notice that. You'll see a lot of Lovity here on the show, and that's because I said back in the summertime, the show is about light, love, and levity, and I said love and levity a little too fast, and all of a sudden, boom, we created Lovity. So the viewers call themselves Lovities, they call me here at the Gym Master Show Live, Mr. Lovity, and they call this Lovity Hall. I think that's really cool. Sometimes some of the greatest things happen by trial and error, <laughs> by mistake. And that's where the Lovity came from. So this is really exciting to have the special guest that we have here on the show because, again, um, we've been working to uh, have a great date for him. Uh, and we picked today because he's got some exciting announcements, some things he's working on. First, let's welcome some. Wow, a great crowd is here and so many others. Uh, anybody that's watching on our YouTube channel, we would love, 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 love it if you could subscribe to the channel because, boy, do we have some Amazing upcoming shows tomorrow. Renowned Greek tenor Mario from Galis is going to be here live from Athens, Greece. That's right. He's going to be here live 
He's internationally known. I interviewed him years ago on public television uh, in America. We've stayed friends ever since. And uh, it's going to be an incredible show tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, and 8 p.m. in Greece, uh, EET, Eastern European time. You can see that on our YouTube channel at Jim Masters TV. And then tomorrow night, we've got Billboard charting, incredible composer, jazz and pop composer, Terry Wallman is going to be here tomorrow night. That's 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Then on Sunday, live from Ireland, the internationally known and wonderful Irish singer and songwriter George Hutton is going to be here live from Ireland on Sunday, and that's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern and uh, noon Pacific, and it'll be 8 p.m. in Ireland, Scotland, and England at that time. So that is on Sunday here on the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. So, uh, yeah, check out all the past episodes. Uh, we've had Melissa Manchester on the show. We've had everybody from Celtic Thunder and Phil Coulter has been on the show and uh, veteran actors from television and so much more. You can see all the episodes on our YouTube channel at Jim Masters TV. And we'd love to subscribe. Uh, looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Fountain Chain 126. Welcome to the show. Watching on YouTube. And greetings, Jim and lovely friends. Thrilled to welcome legendary record producer John Yap to the show today. A great show ahead. Absolutely. Christine is in North Carolina, USA. Merlin is in Ontario, Canada. Good afternoon, Jim and all loveties. Good to see you as well, Merlin. Thanks for joining us a little bit earlier than we normally are. This is our afternoon episode because our guest is in England, in London, so we didn't want to keep him up too late. If we started the show at our regular time at 7 p.m. Eastern, it would be midnight for him, so he'd have to load up on a lot of coffee. <laughs> so good to see you in Ontario. In Cleveland, Ohio, we have Kathy Short with us as well. Good afternoon, Jim and Lovett. He's happy to see everyone again. You too. We were just a couple of hours ago, we were together last night, right, with actor Kevin Sizemore. That was an amazing conversation, wasn't it? Juanita here from South Africa. We love Juanita when you're here. One of our great loveties. Hello, Jim and all the loveties. Lovely loveties. Wishing you all a fabulous weekend. Good to see you, Juanita. Jennifer Barry is here live and direct from Allentown, Pennsylvania, USA. Good to see you. You're going to be zen with our show, Jennifer. We know that. Tesla Bella is here. Good to see you. Tesla Bella is in Florida. So happy to see your face. Toasting you and all the loveties. We toast you as well, Tess who is a wonderful actress and comedian and voice artist herself. Cheers from Merlin in Canada. Bernadette is here as well. Hello, Jim and everyone. Happy Friday. Good to see you, Bernadette. Welcome to the show. Tess says, welcome, John. Really, really cool. And Karen, uh, who's in Nova Scotia. She loves the way I say Nova Scotia. She's in Nova Scotia in Canada. Good Friday evening to you, Jim, and uh, all of my lovely family in beautiful Nova Scotia. Really nice. And you're drinking Tim Hortons coffee. Very yummy. Really, really nice. So it's 2200 where you are there in South Africa. Perfect, right? So I know normally for you in South Africa, when our show starts at seven, it's like what, two, three a.m. or something. But you're a trooper, Juanita. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. Hope you had a good day. Good to see you, Kathleen Walker in New York City. Nice. Also in New York City, Rini Katz, wonderful cabaret star. Hola, Jim and Lovities. Good to see you, Rini. Love having you here. And all the Lovities are saying hello to each other. I think that's cool. Everybody says hello. Pamela is here. Pamela Perkle. Hello, Jim. I'm working while listening. We won't tell anybody. We won't tell the boss that you're working while listening. <laughs> it's only our secret. Good to see you, Pamela. Welcome to the show. Nice to have you here. We love it. And uh, lots of other folks are here. Gene Chesney is here. Gene, stay safe, everyone. Hello to all the loveties. Thanks for joining us from South America and Brazil. One of our regular loveties as well. Carla is here. Hi, Jim and gang. Happy Friday early. It is, uh, what, two? Nice. Very nice for you there in uh, Brazil. Thank you very much. Good to have you here. And hi, everyone back from Kansas City. Nice. Nice to see everybody. And we welcome all those who will be joining us during the course of our live show and also joining us a little bit later in the archives, too, because we archive our shows. So you'll be able to see this show later on 
uh, in the archives anytime you want. A couple more here, and then we'll welcome our illustrious guest to the show. Michael Colby is here. Happy New Year from me. John distributes your cast albums. Yeah, that's right, Michael. And Michael was a great guest on our show uh, just a matter of weeks ago. And he also did that wonderful video tribute to the Gym Master Show live. We're going to be playing all of those video tributes that the guests did and viewers have done celebrating our show uh, coming up real soon. So stay tuned for that. And uh, Janet is here. Hello, Jim and everyone from Janet on Long Island, New York. Welcome, Janet. It's great to have you with us as well. Good to see everybody live. And again, those who will be joining us uh, in the archives when you see this later. There is our illustrious guest, John. Yep, he is uh, live and direct in London. And boy, what a career he's had and continues to have. He's truly amazing. And we're really excited to have him here on the show because he is somebody that, uh, <laughs> well, he has had such a love for MGM musicals, and he's had that love, well, ever since he was a kid with his uh, mother, and uh, he grew up listening to and watching some of the great MGM musicals, and if you're somebody who loves MGM material, well, that's just one of the things. I can tell you that he's had this illustrious career. He's the owner and operator of J Records, and he's had a career that has spanned literally decades. Um, and we're going to talk about that and so much more. He's going to tell us about some of the cool projects he's had an opportunity to work on. But he is live and direct from London, and let's welcome him to the Gym Masters Show live right now. It's great to have John Yap here, live and direct from London. John, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me um, uh, on your show. I, um, I look forward to um, sharing whatever you need me to share with you and your <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so great to have you here, and uh, I like the spot you're in, the lighting and the, the location. It's uh, very warm and inviting, and uh, nice to have you here. And this uh, lover of music again goes way back to this sort of this time period, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's my mother. And it yeah. was like, <laughs> where did you get the picture from? Yeah. Oh, I tell you, we do our research. Yeah. So, so you both, you and your mother, loved MGM musicals, and that sort of sparked your interest in music. Tell us a little bit about that, that time period back then and your mom and some of the exposure to great music that you had an opportunity to soak in, John, back then. Okay. Well, I was much younger than that, uh, than the photo. Uh, when my mother uh, started taking me to, uh, to see uh, those MGM musicals, uh, this was in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, where I was born and I grew up um, until, until about the 14 when I went to England um, and um, and um, she loved all the MGM musicals although although she didn't really quite um, understood what was being sung or spoken but she just loved all the um, the music and the, um, the, the colorful lo exotic locations and, and, and dancing and everything else so she she would take me with her uh, to uh, to see these things, and of course um, I fell in love with all this um, all this MGM um, uh, glorious Technicolor um, musicals, and um, and I can distinctly remember that the very first one that I um, that I can remember seeing was um, Kismet. No, oh, yeah. Yes, and um, and <laughs> and that was because I fell in love with Big Damone. What a and, smooth um, voice too, and his personality and everything just yeah. very smooth. One of the real uh, crooner voices of that time period. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And and um, and of course, um, you know, um, that kept my interest, and and that that's how I started. Uh, my love and appreciation of the uh, musical art form. So you had the love and the appreciation for it, John, but then how did you actually facilitate turning that into a craft for you uh, as far as then 
taking this passion and getting the schooling, the education, and, and sort of creating early on this path to becoming a, a phenomenal record producer? Well, I never thought I'll be I'll be involved in the music business, although from a very from that young age I was uh, a collector. I'm still a collector. I just collect, and um, and and the the and I just collected um, all the soundtrack albums and the cast albums and everything else. Uh, but my destiny then was I was going to be an architect. But oh. um, me too, me too. If I didn't go into television and radio and broadcasting and everything, architecture was, the, yeah. I studied mechanical drawing, took all the classes, yeah. Yes, and I remember uh, um, I, uh, I was so obsessed with listening to musicals and, rec and records um, at that tender young age. My eldest sister, who, um, who, uh, who wasn't quite on the same wavelength as me, uh, she, um, <laughs> I remember, I remember her, 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 her words of wisdom because she was chastising me for spending so much time listening to, um, to recordings. She said, mark my word, this will be your downfall. <laughs> 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 as it turned out, as it turned out, uh, uh this was yeah. my it life. Turned out, it turned <laughs> out, she said, uh, maybe not, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what, what did she say after all the success and everything came? Did she ever turn around to say, well, maybe I was a little off on that comment? <laughs> well, she just keep going. Just, that's it. That's Even it. now, I do remind her, uh, and she just giggles. <laughs> that, oh, my God. That is funny. But, uh, so so that, that's how, that's how, that's how my, my development of you know, collecting, I became a collector. Uh, yeah. And when I collect, I collect. You know, I mean, like downstairs in my uh, library and in my in my in my media room and in my study, I have like thousands and thousands of um, of uh, CDs and Blu-rays, and you know, it's just most of them are even are even sealed and not even opened. I just collect. So. Um, you sound like uh, me because I have a climate controlled storage unit that we pay monthly for that has thousands of CDs, sealed records, sealed LP. So I would get a copy that is sealed and then the copy that you open and that you play. So if you mm -hmm. scratch up the one that you're playing, <laughs> you still have the backup, which is the sealed and, a, and tons and tons of cassettes and CDs, reel to reel tapes with hours of music from you know working in radio stations and for the radio as well uh all there along with all of my career material like work i've done on television and stuff where it needs to be preserved and fireproof and flood proof all in that climate controlled yeah. uh, bin but thousands even even like 2000 cds of just all kinds of christmas music too done in every way you can think about it um so you're a collector. I, you, <laughs> I, I used to have, uh, I used to have maybe nine or 10,000 LPs, you know, uh, of, uh, of um, music, cast albums, soundtracks, personalities. A lot of them were very rare stuff, but I don't have them anymore because they were, my collection was the basis for the start of my, my business career, my business life. Uh, now, how did that happen? Is that because when you were collecting them, you were getting exposed to all this different music and really appreciating all the different kinds of music, and it just continued to uh, build this thirst and this passion for music itself, John? Well, uh, I, I was actually quite um, focused on the, the type of music that I that I um, I liked and, and, and collected they were mainly showbiz personalities on nostalgia you know sort of the, the doris day and diana shore and and uh, johnny mathis and people like that yeah um, sure but uh what happened was that um i i was going to be an architect i went to a i went to a very good um architect architectural college it was one of the top colleges in london 
I wasn't really happy, so I decided to um, to change. After the first year, I decided to change, and be, and uh, and became a graphic designer. I took um, I took a degree um, uh, a degree in graphic designing, and mm, I got my, my that's right. bachelor of art degree in graphic designing. So I'm actually a qualified um, graphic designer. Um, but I was I was then by then by then I've I've come to London and um, and. Um, uh, when was that? How old were you when you decided to move to uh, to England? Say that again. How old were you when you decided to pack your bags and move to England? Well, I've always been an, an Anglophile. Even as a child in Malaysia, I've always wanted to be here in England. Uh, and and I used to uh, thinking back, I used to used to be terrible uh, because. Um, I would only want to eat Western food, and there was only one Western restaurant in Kuala Lumpur um, in the fifties. And I used to, I used to, uh, I used to get my mother to um, stamp my feet. I want, I want, I want, you know, to take me. And what to kind of restaurant? Don't tell me McDonald's. <laughs> no, 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 no restaurant uh, where all the expats and all the English, uh, whatever the foreigners go. Uh, I would go there and have steak and pork chops mm. and you know, in, uh, pies and things like that. I, I I always wanted to eat Western food rather than local food. Yeah. Um, so and so um, as soon as I was of age, I um, I sort of sort of got my 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 way by by asking my father to send me to um, to a boarding school in in England. So I came to um, to a boarding school uh, when I was fifteen, um, and did my O and A levels there, um, sort of higher high education, and um, and then I stayed on. Um, so I was about fifteen when I first came to England, and and at that time, you need to be here for three years uh, bef uh, before you can be naturalized as a um, uh, a British citizen. And as soon as the third year came up, I I applied for British citizen without telling my parents, without, without telling anybody. I just decided to become a British citizen, and 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 I did. Um, just sent my my Malaysian passport to the Home Office and got a British passport and citizenship in return. Up, um, and um, and I've never looked back. And I'm thrilled. I'm glad. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it's obviously it was a great decision uh, for you and one that you pursued and it was a dream and came to fruition. We have a couple photos here uh, that go back a little bit. Um, of course, we showed the this wonderful one of you and your mom. Here's another one too. Tell us oh, about uh, <laughs> uh, This was one of my, uh, I went back to Kuala uh, Lumpur during one of my holidays when I was at school. And you see what I'm wearing? Yes. <laughs> Sweeney Todd T-shirt. Sweeney now, Todd, the yeah. The mahjong. Uh, that's a, that's a game that we're playing. Oh yeah. That's my, yeah. That's my sister um, on on my um, left. Um, uh, the mahjong actually played a very big part in my uh, uh, acquiring my collection. For some strange reason, I'm I've always always more or less the sole winner of the the game. Uh, and on, so yeah. much that people then play with me, <laughs> and I used yeah. and I used to and I used to win because we play small stakes, you know. But, mm -hmm. but age, and I, I used to win, and then I win maybe twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollars, um, Malaysian dollars, and I would just take the money and go straight to the record shop and spend them all buying records from them. You see. And that's how my record collection grew mostly from my winning some major. Who's this handsome chap here? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> that was <some> yes. <laughs> I like the way you said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the hat is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Actually. Where was that that's taken? That's another thing which I love to do was I love traveling. Even at that age, yeah. I traveled a lot. That was Australia. Um, Australia, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Have you had an opportunity? How old were you here? Do you recall? Maybe twenty. Oh, so that was only ten years ago. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> so, what do you want? How many people do you want? <laughs> right. Yeah. You can ship them to Jim Masters. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Here's another cool one. We did our we did our research. We really did our research because we like, you know, I like my audience to really fully understand and appreciate who my guest is and what their passions are and why they do what they do. Uh oh. Uh, uh, uh oh! <laughs> I love your response. I love your response to these. Uh oh! <laughs> That's a good one. Old school in Kuala Lumpur, um, uh, the St. John's Institution. That, that was a Catholic school, and it was like the the premier school uh, of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it's it's uh, it's an English school in that it's taught everybody were taught in English. And it was one of the top, uh, in fact, it's the top school in, 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 um, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and I went to school there until I was 14, 15. Mm. And what were you studying? Was it English or was it uh, several subjects? Oh, all the subjects, but the, me the, the medium of, of, of uh, the language of, uh, of instructions were, was English. Mm. And, uh, and when Malaysia became independent in 19... Uh, 57, um, uh, no, 19, 1957, uh, and then it became Malaysia in 1963, I think. But by 1967, 68, they passed a law, which I thought was a very regressive law, um, in, in which they did away with English being the medium of, of, of instruction. They they, 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 they they brought in Malay, the national language. Um, and so all the schools, including my, uh, my school, um, had to teach everybody in, with the Malay language, which was, mm -hmm. which was really stupid because all the countries around Malaysia, like Thailand and Philippines and even, even um, Japan, were opening up and, and importing English teachers come in and teach their population English and how to speak English. And Malaysia had a population of English speakers and then now they're trying to to regress and, and make the population more fluent in Malay and, and not speak English. I escaped that of course because by then I got to England. Right, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, that's really good. I mean, to have that opportunity to I mean, you're lucky to have been able to escape that. Um, what would you say, John, as you were there sort of setting up what you were going to be doing in England, um, what were some of the first opportunities that you had to work on some music-related projects? Uh, some of the ones that maybe early on for you there really started to get that ball rolling for you, sort of started propelling your own career and your own pursuits? Well, what happened was when I graduated as a graphic designer, um, I, um, I, was, I was very lucky. I got employed almost straight away uh, uh, with, a, with an agency in, um, in, Bons, uh, in, Re in Regent Street, just off Regent Street in London. And... Um, and um, I, I, I was very lucky there in that in that I, I, within the first few couple of months of my being there, I was given a project uh, which I thought was very odd because I was so new and and, and young, uh, uh, to uh, a very important project which was um, which was a brief that British Airways wanted a, a poster campaign uh, for internationally for the the following year. Um, and um, I was given that brief, so I, I came up with a very simple, simple uh, uh, idea. Uh, I called it Windows of the World. And, um, and my basic design is very, very simple. Two, two sort of oblong, like, 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 like two panels of the window opening, reflecting each other, um, you know, like that. Uh, and then in, into those shapes, I put, I would put, uh, say, for example, for New, for, for, for New York, I would put the Statue of Liberty and, um, and, um, and the Empire State Building. And mm -hmm. then just another New York, British Airways, you know, New York on top of British Airways, just that. For London, it would be probably Big Ben and, and the Tower Bridge. So 
uh, that was a very simple, a, a very simple um, uh, uh, idea. But uh, but it was very direct. It says exactly what it said. You know, for Rio de Janeiro, I have the Christ the Redeemer and and the Silver Loaf Mountain, uh, and um, and British Airways bought the idea and bought the campaign. So so I was uh, I was I was I was fated and 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 and, and you know and, and hailed and was given uh, a little bit of. Um, promotional money uh, increasing my pay and then they gave me a second project which was uh, again a travel thing for the maker uh, again that that was adopted by uh, by by the government of Jamaica uh, and at that time I um, I was I was actually already carving a very good career for me within that agency as a graphic designer and um, and at that time I Got interested in opera. Mm. Uh, before then, it was all musical theater and popular music, and and um, and I got interested in opera, and so I started collecting opera records, opera box sets, and being a collector, the collector just grew. And and at that time, I was living in a flat. Uh, of course, there wasn't room for my musical and uh, collecting collection, which which I brought. Over from Malaysia and the growing opera collection, so I yeah. thought I had to. <laughs> so I thought I had to had to get rid of the musical theater collection, uh, reluctantly. But I decided to um, to sell that collection. But I knew by then uh, that um, that um, um, there is a collector's market for the rare items. I wasn't just going to get get a secondhand dealer to come in and take them all away for a few hundred dollars. You know. I, I just advertised in two magazines, the Gramophone and um, and Films and Filming mm -hmm. uh, publications, small ads. My God, the the, the response from, uh, from was the big, world. right? Yeah. It's all my letters were coming in, asking, you know, have you got this? Have you got? I'm looking for this. And, that. and so I started selling those, and then of course I realized that um, that. Um, what I was making, answering a few uh, e letters in the evening, was more than what I was making uh, in a week. Was more than what I was making as a graphic designer in a month. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing okay. how that works. Yeah, uh, if it's money that I want, um, uh, I got the priorities wrong. So I decided a uh, big decision to chuck in my my work and concentrate solely on. Um, on the, the record collection, uh, on, on mail order record, um, and um, so then, then of course, uh, I was I was actually I was actually charging quite a lot of money. I mean, I mean, I was I was very bold. I was asking at that time, I was asking five hundred pounds, sometimes seven hundred fifty pounds, fifty pounds, twenty pounds, forty pounds, a hundred pounds for the rare records, you know, and and I sold them. And then I realized that um, uh, some people can't afford 500 pounds for a, for a rare album, but they said, look, I can't afford 500 pounds, but I can give you 100 pounds plus five of these uh, other albums that I have. And then I realized that those five albums, someone else is looking for them, you know. Uh, right, which is right. So, uh, so what I would do is I would, I would then take a list of people looking for what, what they're looking for and what I've been offered by other people. I'll just take this deal and then resell those five at a bigger price, uh, and so I would make more than five hundred pounds by doing that deal, you know. So in the end, I was buying and selling and exchanging. You became a marketer, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that became a really, really good business. Um, oh, that's my, amazing my how that happens. Yeah, you know, I had that, yeah. uh, not to that level, but uh, I have a. Uh, there's actually a, a group on Facebook called Beautiful Instrumentals and Vocals uh, fan page, and that grew out of. Um, this Yahoo group that I started in 2000, I can't believe 2000 is 20 years ago already, but it was an international uh, music discussion group with uh, record producers and musicians and conductors and fans and radio station people and the whole thing. And the group lasted uh, up till about last year because Yahoo shut down all the groups and we merged it and put it on Facebook. And I told the group that uh, I had, um, you know, of course, the orchestra leader, Percy Faith, 
Uh, yeah, no, for a lot it. of yeah, summer place and just incredible music, but also uh, Christmas music too. A lot of great Christmas music, which we just heard airing, you know, during the holiday season. And um, have all those albums, have the whole thing, a lot of Christmas music. And um, I knew that the group was talking about one particular c CD that came out in very limited release, and it was. Uh, Music of Christmas. It was Percy Faith Orchestra, Music of Christmas. And there were specific songs on there that were very hard to find. Now, you can get it on the LP, but you couldn't get it remastered since the original on CD. Well, I just happened to be um, at a little tiny, it's like a liquidation place, a place, a little outlet place, you know, not a dollar store, but a place where they sell things for $3, $5. You know, it's a like a surplus store, warehouse place. You can get anything, kitchenware, whatever you need. So I went to the right to the CD section and I would always go there like I used to do with Tower Records and all the record stores. And I would thumb through digging and digging because I knew the categories of music that I wanted. And I found on CD, Percy Faith Music of Christmas. And I went right on to the group and I said, hey, everybody, because it's an international group. I said, hey, everybody, I found a CD, which is um, Percy Faith. It's remastered on CD. It was a limited run. Uh, I think Columbia did it or somebody affiliated with Columbia. And um, and I, I have, well, I actually found two. One we play and the other one is still sealed. <laughs> But all of a sudden, not only did the group uh, come at me like, oh, my God, where did you find that? I have to get that. I have to have it. I have to have it because they're very hungry for the music and they're very, you know, they're aficionados of music. And um, I said, well, I just found it haphazardly at an outlet store where I bet you the people that run the store, the management, they have no idea what this even is. They just threw it in a bin and they sold it for four dollars and eighty eight cents. And I was like, oh, my God, what an incredible deal. So I went to three other locations of that store digging, and I found another one, another one, and another one, and another one. And then I, I knew there were locations in New York, so I went to the New York locations. I'm going to this one, digging, in the, and there's another one, and another one. And I'm like, oh, my God, for $4.88 each. And I was telling the group about it. So I said, you know what, just for the heck of it, I just want to see the response. I think I'll put one up on eBay. This is like 10, 15 years ago. I'll put one on eBay just to see, because I know it's rare and it maybe will make somebody happy because they want that album remastered on CD. So, and it was a limited run. So I put it on eBay and within seconds, that thing sold, I think within me 30 seconds of me putting it on. And there was a bidding war that was happening. I was like, I put it on for like $10 maybe. So you make $5, you pay five and make five more. And that's yeah. it for the, you it's know, I, it was unbelievable what happened. There was a bidding war between people, blah, 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 blah. And I, it went up to $200. And wow. then people started contacting me privately, sort of overriding it. And if you have any more, I'll buy them directly. I'll pay this price. Don't even put them on there. I'll buy. And it was, it was a feeding frenzy. It was some, so then I was running to the stores and digging in the bins and there's another one for $4 and 88 cents. And there's another, and I was putting them, I kept mine of course, and I gave a couple to family members as gifts, but it was unbelievable. I had no idea. It reminds me of your story because I had no idea. This happened to me uh, uh, when, when uh, at that time, of course, but I think it's less likely nowadays because um, uh, because of the fact that people can stream, they can copy, they can make um, uh, CD, CD copies and things like that. But that's what happened. So anyway, um, the mail order took off and, and uh, it was so successful that I I, I started buying a lot of, uh, going, like you, I went to all the secondhand stores and all over the country and started picking up all the, all the rare items that I know that were up in demand. My my home got inundated, overrun by old old records. I just felt that I had to now um, clear clear the, 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 the home off. Was oh, that business. hard to do? That must have been uh, hard to do. No. 
basically they were they were they were my business but i, I thought it wasn't fair on my partner to have this room just full of stacks of, of, of records <laughs> so, of records, um, yeah. so so i decided to, to 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 start a shop a record shop specializing in musical theater i took um i took in a partner and to get and then we found a, a, a premises in drew lane which is a perfect address for this kind of shop uh, because Drury Lane is famous for its theatrical, um, um, historical um, in, um, significance. And, Absolutely. And we started a shop, uh, the only one of its kind in the world at the time when we started, specializing only in musical theater and related products, rare as well as new recordings. And that shop became a phenomenal success. Um, um, we had people from all over the world, mail order and personal callers. And then we have institutions like like the BBC and ITV and, 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 and the French radio and German radio and Spanish radio. They were all wanting to buy from us because, the, because you know, because like, for example, when, when BBC interviewed Lauren before when she was mm. here to do uh, applause, uh, they didn't have the recording of applause, uh, the Broadway cast. So they had to buy from us and, um, and because they needed to play a track, you know, and, uh, of, of her singing uh, in the applause. So, and then all these radio stations and television stations gave us a, a, stand, a standing order, like every new every new release uh, of, of a cast album from London and New York, just send it to us and build us, you know. So we have an inbuilt uh, a business, uh, which was great. Mm. Um, so that was a business. And then when Covent Garden, uh, the Piazza, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with the Piazza, which is um, the flower garden, which was developed and which became, became uh, a huge success. When they were developing the, the piazza from the flower market into um, shops, uh, they invited businesses all over the country to, to send in application for one of the 49 units. And, um, but they were looking for interesting shops and interesting business. And we submitted our application. Obviously, obviously of course, we, we, we got it because our, our, our shop is perfect for what they're looking for. It's a specialist musical theater record shop that that's an, that no other shops in the world uh, in London uh, is like that. So we, we moved into Covent Garden. And of course, the business took up even greater to greater heights. And um, and it was a huge success, um, flash with money. Uh, and then I needed to expand, but I knew that one of the successes of, the reason for the success of those shops is that me being there to talk to customers about the musical and about new recordings and so that because I knew about that. And somebody um, had a question. Martin Dooley's watching on our YouTube channel. Welcome, Martin, to the Gym Master Show Live. Was the name of the shop in Drury Lane area dress? And then Fountain Chain 126 says at Martin Dooley, I think it was a different shop, but I think John went on to eventually run Dress Circle okay. in Covent Garden. Tell us about that. Okay, what happened was that um, I'm just about to come to that actually. Uh, now the um, uh, because because I needed to expand, I, I needed I couldn't open another shop because I got to be there. So I decided to start a record label and started recording cast albums for ourselves. Um, we started and um, and uh, and it became too much for me to run the label and the shop. So I sold my share of the shop to my ex partner. And I became the sole uh, owner of the record label. That shop uh, started off as um, Dress Entertainment Records, became Dress Circle. So Dress Circle came out of my shop. Um, my ex-partner changed the name. I retained Dress Entertainment from a record label, and he had to find a new name. And so he found um, uh, the new name of Dress Circle. And so to answer those questions, Martin's question, Yes, um, Dress Circle was an extension of my shop. Um, so. That's terrific. So they got that question answered. Um, we have some more photos here too, John, taking us down memory lane here. Um, tell us about this one. I'll sh we'll show the photos and then you can take us maybe on this journey. Uh, and there's some exciting projects that you've been working on and there was 
uh, the release of something very, very near and dear to your heart and very important back in December that we're going to touch upon in a minute or so too. But uh, let's run, let's go back in time and run through some of these beautiful photos. A lot of our lovely viewers around the world and they're watching from all, all over the globe as they do here on our show. They're loving these photos and they love your reactions to the photos when you go, uh oh, oh no. <laughs> But here are some here are some great ones here. Tell us about this one. I love that. <laughs> yeah, you, I love that. You were thinking about what to say, right? <laughs> I love, I love that. that. <laughs> great reaction. Oh, this one. Yeah. Ah, yes. This I was uh, was when Sondheim came in to um, to work with Maria Friedman uh, mm. on her song and her interpretation of. Um, of uh, Faye for the recording of Anyone Can Whistle, uh, and um, and um, and it was a, a very special time for me. Uh, but of course, I have worked with uh, Steve um, uh, on several other projects before. But even so, it was absolutely amazing to to just be there when uh, when, when Maria is singing and and all Steve needed to say a word or two. That changed everything, you know. Mm. He didn't have to be very. He didn't have to go through it in great detail. He just say, do it as though as you are, or do it this way, and and you know. So that yeah. was at Abbey Road Studios. That's the the the, the Beatles Studio Studio Two. Yeah, yeah, Abbey yeah, with so Sondheim. Very, yeah. I mean, what what was it like to have Sondheim, you know, there in that uh, atmosphere? I mean. Oh, it, was it was unbelievable. I mean, you have Sondheim, and then you're in the studios where the Beatles recorded. I mean, you've just merged several worlds there together, which is unbelievable. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, two. I mean, two legendary situations. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Um, uh, so at that stage, I think Sondheim's been to my home twice by then. Um, because um, I recorded the Pacific Overtures, uh, the English National Opera production, mm -hmm. and the London Arts recording of Into the Woods. And both times, uh, Sondheim came to the um, to my house to listen to the first uh, edits and mix. Uh, um, and and uh, each time when he came, I um, I was um, I was uh, always very apprehensive because I know that um, Sondheim's notes and comments are legendary. They, are, they run for pages, you know, pages and pages and pages. So to play, when we play back um, uh, Pacific Overtures, which is a complete recording of the English National Opera production, uh, I thought, oh my God, what am I going to, um, what am I going to, um, to uh, get from Steve? And if I can remember, I thought I was I was I was shocked because all all he ever wanted to change was the opening drums that we had the, 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 this the, this production and um, and on the recording, which is the faithful re, uh, recording of the piano production, it opens with the with the shakuhachi, the the, the Japanese kind of uh, fluty uh, kind of uh, serene thing um, music. Um, and then it's interrupted by the Japanese drums, and and then and then and then it goes on, and then it goes faster. Uh, Sondheim wanted me to take out four beats of the drums. I said, okay, dun, dun, dun. all right. He <laughs> says it's going on too long. Just take out four of those four of those uh, drum beats. And that was one of his comments. Um, it's, uh, his second comment was um, on the, um, the 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 uh, the the Peter song, um, uh, "Please Hello," uh, which is a pastiche of the um, pastiche of the Gilbert and Sullivan Peter song. Um, and so the the English singers, uh, because. Um, the English opera singers, they're so used to singing Gilbert and Sullivan. It was like a piece of cake for them to sing it in, uh, in, in a Gilbert and Sullivan style, which was, in, which was more patter than singing. Mm. Uh, 
and and uh, Sondheim thought that they were just a little bit too much of Hatter, and he wanted them to sing more in tune, more of the of the notes. Uh, luckily, we did have one take where where we did have them singing a lot more than Hatter, and those mm -hmm. were the only two moments. Uh, uh, for um, for um, Pacific Overtures, which is a yeah. double scene, um, two and a half hours long. I, I was thrilled. I was I was shocked. Yeah, absolutely thrilled in a in a very positive and beautiful way. I'm sure, John. If everybody's joining us or anybody joining us, I'm your host, Jim Masters. We're live. Jim Masters show live. Our regularly scheduled time is usually 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We've got a very special broadcast at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, noon Pacific, 8 p.m. right now, uh, just past all of that in uh, England and Ireland, Scotland. Our very special guest is legendary record producer John Yap, uh, owner of J Records. And we're talking about some of the extraordinary uh, experiences he's had in his life, his career, but also some upcoming uh, details of some wonderful projects that have just been released. Here's another great photo. Tell us about this one, John. Well, there's my two leading ladies, of course. That's Julia McKenzie, the great Julia McKenzie, and uh, Maria Friedman. Now, when I when I um, when I um, uh, first thought of uh, approaching uh, uh, Sondheim and Arthur Lawrence um, to do the first complete recording of Anyone Can Be So, I knew, of course, they would be, especially Steve, would be very interested in my casting ideas. Now here where I did something very crafty, um, I thought, okay, um, I know that Steve and, and Julia are the best of friends and Steve loves Julia. And the same thing, Steve and Maria, Steve loves Maria and, um, and they are the best friends as well because both Julia and, and, and Maria have done and championed Steve's um, shows and music all their lives. So I said to him, well, I, I would like Julia McKenzie to be Cora and Maria Friedman to be Faye, and Steve was delighted. Totally. Oh, absolutely, you know. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so I knew I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I, I knew I did the right thing in second by casting the two ladies. But of course, it's not just that. It's just, it, as it turned out, I think the both of them gave the most wonderful, amazing, uh, definitive performances of the roles, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially Julia, um, the um, the uh, what Julia did was um, and Maria as well, of course. Uh, what they did was uh, was uh, they they decided to act the part rather than spoof it or caricature it. So you know, some too many people seem to think that Cora is a uh, is is a caricature, a cartoonish, and should be funny. Uh, yes. She is funny because some of the words that she comes out, even now when I listen to it, I laugh because they're so funny. But Julia um, uh, uh, got hold of the part and, and decided to, to portray Cora as, as what Cora is. Cora is not a lovable, funny, cartoonish you know, a, a, a woman. She is an ambitious, uh, quite ruthless, and uh, immoral and greedy, politician like someone we know um you know it's probably just going out um, and, and, so, and someone we words, some, like someone we dialogue, someone we currently know <laughs> yeah, but over the, here some of, some of the words that is uncanny some of the words that were spoken by then, um by, by yeah. cora and by everybody it's just like what you're hearing today yeah. <laughs> words like lock them up Maybe you that's know? the maybe that's the playbook the that's being used. <laughs> in the cage, women and children first, and the most funny thing, the, the most uncanny one is uh, Cora uh, towards the end of the show, uh, when she knew that she 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 couldn't hang on anymore. Guess what she said? I don't resign. I won't resign. You know, mm. you are fired. You are all fired. <laughs> Out the White House. I am taking over. Now, who do you think <laughs> who do you think I did with it? Say, you know, so sounds uh, so very very uh, familiar. Yeah, yeah. and um, <laughs> and, uh, and because and because uh, Julia did it seriously as as a character, 
Yeah. That's why she's so stunning for them. Yeah. And the same thing with Maria. Um, Maria acted emotionally. She just didn't sing those songs. She, mm -hmm. she conveyed her emotions into the title song, for example. You've never heard the title song sung by anyone else as Maria, Maria sang it because Maria invested a lot of emotions into that song and sang it emotionally. Um, and that was sanctioned by, by Steve. Actually, Steve was there in the studio when, when Maria recorded it and he was thrilled. Um, and, um, and so the two leading ladies were great. Um, I, I got them. For the men, for the man, for Hapgood, I, um, originally I did have, I'm, I'm not going to tell, tell you who it was, uh, a Broadway um, a star in the row. And, mm. um, and um, uh, I've spoken to him. He actually accepted it. Well, he sort of uh, was, oh, yeah, I love to do it but it, he wasn't signed. Then um, my very, very dear friend, who turned out to be one of my best friends, but she, she's dead now, poor thing, um, who was um, the agent of John Barrowman, who was then an upcoming young actor uh, in the Western. As a music. She said, oh, uh, John, um, uh, she called me John. Uh, said, Can, would you do me a favor? You know, would you, would you uh, give John the chance um, to, um, you know, to make a, a, a recording in a major role, you know, take a take a take a take a, a, a risk from him, mm. and I said, okay, I have to, of course, um, get it past Sondheim. Um, but uh, if he if he if if he, because nobody knows uh, from America knows who John Barryman was at that time, you know, right? And um, as luck would have it, uh, because Sondheim knew that I was looking. We were talking about the man. Um, as luck would have it, he was in town at the time. Uh, he went to see a show called The Fix at the Donmar Warehouse, in which John Barryman was the, the leading man. And, um, and when Sondheim, uh, 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 when Steve um, got home that night, got back to the hotel, he called me about 11.30ish, you know. He said, John, I've got have good for you. And I said, oh, OK. He said, I've just seen this wonderful guy called John Barryman, and you should try and get him. I knew I had him already, mm. but I wanted to play. Who? I just say, okay, I'll try and find him. Try we'll to try him. to get him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, next morning I rang up my friend Janet and said, "Look, John is cast," and she was thrilled. And then I, 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 I spoke to someone and said, "Okay, I got John Barryman." And I said, "Oh, that's great." <laughs> That's and, right. uh, yeah, you're good. You're fast. <laughs> and so, and so the, 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 the three, the three leads in, in my recording of Element from the Soul was so more or less cast in conjunction with Sondheim, really. Mm, as, for Arthur Lawrence, as for Arthur Lawrence, um, uh, doing the, 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 the role of the narrator, actually, uh, people seem to think that he's like just narrating uh, in the recording, but in fact, in fact, um, uh, Arthur Lawrence um, was playing a part. The narrator is actually a part in the original version. If you look at the, 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 the cast list of the original version, there is the narrator as part of the cast. And so, um, and so originally, I wanted uh, Steve uh, to do the narration, the, the narrator. Um, and, um, and Steve said, look, you know, I don't really feel comfortable uh, doing these sort of things, you should ask Arthur. And um, and at that time, I did work with Arthur. Uh, well, not work with him, but I did have a kind of relationship with Arthur because I recorded uh, a show that he wrote with Charles Strauss and um, Richard Maltby called um, Nicanora. And um, and uh, to cut a long story short, I managed to placate Arthur's objection to that recording being made by promising him that I'll do something else with him, you know. Uh, and this something else was anyone can whistle that came up. And so I called him and said, look, okay, Arthur, look, why don't, would you like to be the narrator in this recording? And he then said, absolutely, yes, you know. And, um, and so that's how he became the narrator. It's an amazing story, John. A couple people actually uh, have some cool questions. Uh, Martin asks, when was 
the Anyone Can Whistle recorded, John? Uh, 1977, I, I believe, if, uh, if my memory serves. And so, uh, in 77, I guess. Right? You said 77? 1977. 77. Yeah, they were guessing that it was uh, 97, but no. Yeah. They said 1997. Uh, 1997 sorry. Uh, ah, fountain chain 126 20, knows your thing. He says, 20, a few years after Julia retired from doing stage musicals, I think maybe John can discuss this. 1997. 1997, uh, 2017, 17. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, 1997. Okay, so uh, um, uh, what do you want? Uh, that, well, anyway, the reason why it's been delayed uh, uh, the, uh, to now, maybe it's fate. Yeah. Maybe uh, maybe it's fate because 2020 is the perfect time to release a complete recording of Anyone Can Whistle, which, which actually brought the story and the plot into the picture because the previous recordings unless you've seen the show and or read, or read the, the complete uh, a script, you have no idea about the political um, situation in the story. I mean, the political situation in Anyone Can Whistle, and the social situation as well, uh, mm -hmm. Anyone Can Whistle, uh, is, is almost uncannily uh, similar to what was happening, or what is happening in 2020, you know? So, mm. so if I released this five years ago, or even last year, or even uh, three years ago, or 20, ten years ago, it would it, the, the, the link wouldn't be wouldn't be as 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 phenomenal. I mean, lines like the theaters are dark. I mean, it was a throwaway line that meant to be funny, but of course not true. But now in 2020, when when, when the theaters are dark around the world, you know. Just they a are. line like that. Theaters are dark. So, so I think maybe fate helped help the release of that back to 2020. Um, but uh, the reason why it was delayed was that I just had too much on my plate. Um, so much so that I just didn't have time. And and of course, 2020, the uh, the lockdown in March, that started yeah. in March, gave me <laughs> suddenly I decided, oh, okay, what am I going to do with this lockdown? <laughs> right. Um, okay, I'll. Pay. So, and that's how I I, I, um, I I managed to finish it. Um, and thanks to th thanks to the lockdown, anyone can whistle was finished. Otherwise, I would be busy. I've got two two major projects waiting for yeah. me in New York. Uh, one was then what's going to happen? What was it? Was going to happen in March? Mm. Just before the lockdown, I was supposed to fly over to New York and make that recording. But now it's it's been postponed to God knows when. So now, for anybody that's watching that isn't familiar with Anyone Can Whistle, tell us more about it so they know what it's about so they can get it, too. And congratulations on that, because that was just released only a matter of weeks ago in uh, December, right? Uh, end of November. Congratulations. Well, if I, if not officially, officially released on December the 3rd, I believe. But we, but we did have the stock at end of November, and we did have pre-orders and so a lot of people uh, received uh, the recordings at the end of November, but it was officially released on December the 3rd. And Now for anybody uh, that's not familiar with that work, what it's about, tell us a little bit more about it, the importance of Anyone Can Whistle. Well, the thing is that, um, is that um, the one thing which a lot of people don't realize, only because the, the, the two previous recordings, the original cars and the concert cast recording because they only recorded the songs and and even then the songs were cut shortened uh, is uh, anyone can be say is actually a, a really great dance musical because there's a lot of dance music in it including a 10 oh, 10 minute ballet and uh, the cookie dance uh, the cookie chase which is like eight and a half to nine minutes long is mostly dance and in fact uh, looking back at some of the original reviews when it first opened on Broadway in 1964, almost all the reviews commented on how wonderful the choreography for the um, cookie dances. And then, of course, there are all this extended dance music within the songs that were all cut out of the previous recordings. So, um, uh, Anyone Can Whistle is actually a, almost a, it's almost a dance musical. 
And it's interesting to note that the only um, Tony Award nomination anyone can be still received uh, the Broadway production was um, uh, for her, uh, Herbert Ross, the choreographer, for his dances. So, so that's the first thing that that uh, that that I've discovered through working on this that Animal Canvasser is actually a dance musical as well. But uh, but it's also a political satire, uh, which again, uh, because a lot of the uh, scenes and dialogue they were cut out of the original of all the, the, the previous recordings, uh, people didn't realize that it's actually a, a, a political satire in mm -hmm. the grand truth of, 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 of um, a great political uh, satirical plays, you know, fighting mm -hmm. politically disguised as a comedy. Um, so it's so, it's it's so perfect, perfect for our times. You, you you release this at such a an yeah. extraordinary. It just turned out the, the timing of the release, but it's so yeah. perfect. Well, <laughs> well, the story is the story has unfolded before us. So basically, the story is this downtown town run by this crooked crooked mayor and and her and her henchmen. Um, they they are they are they are there to siphon money off uh, of the community. And the town is bankrupt, and there's everybody's unemployed, and there's all the shops and restaurants, shops and businesses are closed, and um, and they have to and they have to then appeal and and, and work on the religious um, uh, 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 fervor of, of of half the population, uh, creating fake news and fake miracles, promising fake miracles and fake cures and. And also, things, which is the same story as what we're experiencing now. Um, the only difference is that there is a uh, there is um, the added character of Faye uh, and, and Hapgood. Um, and um, Faye was uh, 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 her, 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 her main function was to want to expose the uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the the fake the, the fakery uh, the, the fraud and yeah. Hapgood. Hapgood is, is one of those insane, I guess, one of one of the people who are like like us. What is sanity, you know? And there's a little side story going on there. But basically, yeah. the, the the political element is, uh, is, is 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 what it's all about because it's all about locking people up, the wrong kind of people, the people that don't uh, uh, fit into the uh, the core yeah. and help the whole uh, stance. Mm -hmm. um, and so what? that's basically the story. What? I want to show you something. The best thing about this, according to Martin Dooley watching, and good to have you with us, Martin. Hope you'll join us regularly. Whistle recording, the best thing about it is that it is complete. He actually saw the original show in Philadelphia back in 1964. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Well, of course, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the complete recording of anyone can this show is, um, is, is just, it's one. It's amongst my series of complete recordings. I think I'm the only record company in the world that recorded all these uh, great scores, classic scores, and new works. Uh, what I think um, uh, uh, deserving of it, complete. Um, exactly right. Some of them are complete, including the whole book, uh, the whole play, and most, uh, uh, all of them are complete. Of it, all the score, all the, every word, every note. Every every note is recorded, and uh, that's I, that's I think the thing that people need to understand about what you do, and and you do a lot of different things at J Records there in London. But one of the claims to fame is doing that is taking the time to to actually bring back the entire complete work of an actual uh play or what have you i mean like you said every aspect of it the book every word every score every note every everything is yeah. the complete experience and you're one of the only ones around yeah. it's actually yeah. the only one internationally yeah. that's doing that and spending yeah. what are some of the others that you've had an opportunity to work on and present yeah, well, in completeness like that oh i had about so far I've done over 70 to 80 complete recordings. Um, but of course, new works, you know, like uh, like John Kander, Kander and Ab, uh, but John, new work with his new partner. Um, uh, called, uh, they did a musical called The Landing. Uh, I recorded the cast album that there was an off-Broadway cast um, recording. 
I did it complete. It was three short plays, three short musicals, but I recorded them complete, the whole play. Mm. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's wonderful. And you, you can only experience the landing and understand what the landing, uh, Candace, John Candace landing is about, listening to the whole play. Just listening to the songs, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, so, and so the complete, but, um, but um, um, the, 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 other, the other one that, that, that I'm really very proud of is the complete recording of um, One Touch of Venus. Um, Kurt Bau, One Touch of Venus. Uh, now, I was just going to say, the reason for my wanting to record these things complete is, um, is um, when I realized way back in the, in the, in the 70s, actually, um, or 80s, um, where all the major revivals of all the, the shows, uh, all the classics, excepting for some of the iconic ones like West Side Story, um, but uh, other, 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 other revivals, have all been reorchestrated, rewritten, uh, cut down uh, in size, and you know, and 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 and, and revised, and what they call reviso, and updated, and everything else. That I decided that I want to preserve all the original versions um, in a complete recording before they disappear. Um, so that that's what started my idea of, of recording. Uh, the complete versions of the original work. Um, like somebody, uh, somebody mentioned about my fair lady in South Pacific and uh, and um, uh, the King and I. Uh, yes, until my complete recording. Well, well those, those those my complete recordings are the only complete recordings of those great American classics. Can you believe it? You know, um, my fair lady. Uh, yes, there are several recordings of it. But none of them are complete, except for mine. So my, my recordings has a lot of music that you can't hear on the other on the other um, recordings. I mean, the King and I, for example, uh, Uncle Thomas Cabin. Uh, yes, there are attempts there are attempts to record um, the, the complete ballet, but my my recording is the only one ha that has the complete ballet uncut. Um, I don't see I don't see the the point of recording. A ballet, and then started cutting little bits out of it in between, and just to shorten it. Instead of a ten-minute piece, they shorten it to six minutes. So it makes nonsense of the of the of the structure and the flow of the ballet. Mm -hmm. You know, what was very what was very um, uh, uh, obvious was when you listen to the um, there is a recording of guys and dolls where they recorded their Havana uh, sequence, the Havana ballet. Uh, which uh, lasts for about 12 minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I recorded it completely all 12 minutes, but that recording cut it to six minutes. And then suddenly it became very jerky. It, 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 it's building up, the, 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 the ballet is building up to something, and then suddenly it go, it's gone to another bit, which makes no, no sense, you know, and, um, and uh, better not record the ballet if, if, it, if they want to record the full 12 minutes of it, you know. Got so, some more. So, and, yeah. Anyway, that, that's the, that's how that's why I record all these complete recordings, and it's, and and I think that it's coming. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's your legacy, and it's incredible. It must it must be painstaking to do it right. I mean, to get it right, and you must really it must the the, the amount of time, time and attention must be time extraordinary. Consuming, time, time consuming, consuming taking, and very expensive. <laughs> but uh, but of course uh, now. Not even the major companies can afford to do them, or even want to do them. No one else now is going, ever going to be record uh, the complete version unless the owners and the estates pay five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand dollars to make a complete recording of, of the King and I. You know. So um, why is or, it that you you feel compelled to do it? But you feel it's probably the only way people will ever be able to experience it is if you do it. It's my love and respect for the musical theater. I certainly never did it to make money because I know I would never recoup on this on this uh, on these recordings because they're just too expensive and 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 um, and, and I know that that, that, that is a it's a it's market that is going is uh, going to be very slow burning. Uh, maybe after I'm dead and gone, 
people will suddenly say, oh my God, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, there was this person who did this, all these treasures. But, um, but um, uh, the most happy fella cost me 800,000 pounds to make, wow. which is almost a million dollars. Yeah. I would sell enough to make, to make that money back. But I, I'm absolutely thrilled and, I, and, and I'm so pleased that I recorded the complete recording of the most happy fella because incomplete because it's um it's given me a lot of joy and a lot of satisfaction and a lot of pride and the same yeah. thing that anyone can go and pacific overtures now who would have who, who would think that you would want to record one of sondheim's at that time um considered difficult work or or, or not very popular who are this who who would be wanting to spend five hundred thousand four hundred thousand four five hundred thousand dollars pounds to record a complete recording of that right exactly but the funny story is that at that, at that time i had a huge huge hit album uh at the time i was recording uh, i was releasing film soundtracks as well and i released um the soundtrack to rambo remember rambo oh sure yeah yeah and, ooh, michael Colby said he's loving this he's got to take off but he hopes to see you in new york and okay. when Brandoon comes alive again and michael you can watch this whole episode again on youtube at jim masters tv so you can circle back michael michael's wonderful he was one of our great guests too he's loving this conversation uh he's got to he's got to duck out quickly but he'll be back to watch the uh the full thing in its entirety you know while we're here with this question yeah, I need to I, I need to finish that Rambo story. Yeah, yeah, finish that. So, Rambo sold a lot, and uh, and uh, and it, it, it's sort of I, I found a lady. Um, um, uh, this goes to, to the fact that when I, I when I chose to record works that are not commercial, that are not obvious, but mm. something a gem, and I recorded this cast album of, of called Goblin Market, an off Broadway. A musical starring Anne Morrison and Terry Kausner, a two two hander. But it's beautiful. It's um, Holly Penn wrote the music and lyrics. Uh, uh, the lyrics are based on an English um, uh, book, uh, English poems uh, called Goblin Market. Anyway, I recorded um, I recorded um, uh, that album, uh, an opera big house, and the lady uh, who was a very rich um, uh, lady. Uh, in New York, she she was a producer, and she was so thrilled that I recorded it that um, that when I told her I was looking at um, wanting to record Pacific Overtures and it's going to be very expensive, and just like that she said, "Oh, don't try to give fifty thousand dollars to us," and oh, you know, um, here you are, fifty thousand um, dollars to what we're calling um, Pacific Overtures. But at the time, Rambo sold incredibly well. I, I, you know, a lot. And at that time, when you re release an album, you can sell 100,000 units, you know, with no problem. Um, but um, so Rambo basically financed Pacific Overtures, um, uh, my recording. And so when I told <laughs> Son Steve Sondheim this, uh, this news, I say, actually, it's Rambo who financed this. He was tickled pink. He just laughed and, and couldn't stop laughing. So, uh, so occasionally he would still mention, oh, how's Rambo doing? <laughs> That's incredible. So, what a great story that is. <laughs> I'm glad you finished that story. That was worth the wait. Yeah, there was somebody that had uh, the question and that I believe, if we can scroll up a little bit. Oh yeah, it was Fountain Chair 126. John, do you have other classic musicals on the Masterworks label that have yet to be released. Okay, I can tell you what some of them are. Uh, you see, the thing is one of the reasons why I'm so busy at the moment, at the moment I'm working on several projects, is that I actually stopped POW. Thank God I did. At the time when I was when I could afford to record and, and I had the money to record, I stopped POW them. And so I have complete recordings uh, waiting for me to finish. Uh, of uh, Fiddle on the Roof, uh, The Music Man, Brigadoon, Hair, 42nd Street, um, and um, Annie. 
Wow. The Fantastics. So these are all complete recordings waiting. You know, waiting, waiting for, for the John Yap me, touch. <laughs> uh, one of them, one of them I'm going to be working on this year, uh, mm. very soon. I'm going to start working on, but I won't tell you which one though. No, but no, they're no, all one. I mean, like, like for example, uh, I know that there's going to be a new, a new production of, of the Music Man on Broadway. It will mm. be rewritten. It will be re. It will be revised, and it will, it will have new arrangement. But the ballet that is attached to Mary and the Librarian, the long ballet, which I'm sure is not going to be the new version, is wonderful. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it's, um, it's, it's almost like a Copeland uh, piece, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's in the recording, which, which I'm sure will excite a lot of people when, when, when my music eventually comes out. And of mm. course, Forty Second Street, you know, all those wonderful dance breaks um, that are not recorded, um, because um, uh, if any if any album claims to have recorded them, they have to be a double album. Right. Know? But so there isn't a single double album in Forty Second Street, but mine will be a double album, you know, because it's got all those extended wonderful dance breaks. Um, in, in between. That's so, incredible. Mm. That's amazing. Really exciting yeah. stuff coming up. I want to take people, they're loving the photos too. We thank Doug for sending these along. Uh -huh. How about this one? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh there's the uh-oh again. <laughs> they love when you do that. Uh-oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. You're, oh, you're in, you're in. <laughs> that's uh-oh and oh. <laughs> Delayed reaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, tell us about what's happening here and who you're with, of course. Uh. Suddenly cutting me off. So, why are you recording anyone? Can we so? Shiitake. Sondheim. <laughs> uh, I, I think we were just discussing Maria's uh, take on um, anyone can we so? I don't mm. know. <laughs> I yeah. can't remember. That's a it great. Very... It's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful shot there. Um, here's another. Oh, oh that, that, that's definitely, I love that. Uh, we showed that, showed it, showed the previous one that that was that would be good. The previous one, which, uh, if you can show, if you can focus it here, here. let's yeah, see. The, the one, the, let's see, th this one's coming out a little uh this fuzzy. One, this yeah, one, this one of two very special people. Can you, is it's out of focus? Yeah, for some reason, when they sent it, it's uh, they send it out of focus. Oh, it looks like. Well, but, I can tell you who they are. I can tell you who yeah. they are on the um, um, on the um, on on the on, on on the lady is Judy Dench. Was Judy Dench? Yes. And and the man was uh, Fred Ebb. Uh, of Camden Ave, you know. Mm. Uh, and we were we were recording the complete Dame Judy Dench. Mm. Uh, what is it's saying that that uh, that. Uh, but I think you have another one of Judy Dench uh, uh, further on. Um, yeah, that's a uh, little. Oh, that, yeah, that's Judy Dench and that's Fred Ebb. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in black, we went. This, we were at Abbey Road again, recording the uh, complete recording of um, of uh, Cabaret. And that's the color one of uh, you with Sondheim, which I think is yeah. awesome. Here's another one too. Ah, that's Arthur Lawrence. Mm-hmm. I have a very funny story to tell about Arthur Lawrence. Do you want, do you want, do you want to hear it? Yeah, absolutely. It's quite soft. I mean, he's no longer with us, so it's okay. I didn't know it. Right. Right. Well, uh, when Arthur Lawrence, uh, when I picked him up um, uh, from the Savoy Hotel where he was staying um, to come to the studio, um, uh, his agent said, uh, you know, Arthur only has half an hour, okay? He can't stay longer than half an hour, so you've got to Record everything you need in half an hour, and has got, got to go back to the hotel. Okay, so um, I picked him up, and and we walked in the studios. And now that's Jonathan Allen, the engineer. Okay, he's actually a very handsome guy, um, um, and um, and but he's straight, and um, and so Arthur Lawrence obviously took a shine to him, um, and. Um, and um, and so when I said to Arthur, I said, "Oh, Arthur, I know that you 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 got a limited time here. You got to leave in half an hour." He said, "Oh no 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 no! I can stay for as long as you like, you know." <laughs> so 
basically, I think Jonathan was there and he wanted to just be as long to be with Jonathan, the engineer, uh, uh, for as long as he, uh, he um, um, can. Yeah. But he, he stayed longer than half an hour. Stayed longer than the half hour. <laughs> and he was, he, was, he was actually, he was actually um, uh, closing up to Jonathan. But Jonathan was straight, he's straight. So I said to Jonathan, I said, Jonathan, Chips, best sex story. Anyone can be so, you know, mm. you may be able to control those if you play your card right. Yeah. But Jonathan, no. no. Here's another great shot. Oh, okay. You my two leading ladies. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice yeah that's a yeah. nice one. love working yeah, with them, right? honestly, at that time um i don't know where people uh that's maria Re uh because i don't know where um i didn't realize that she was she was um tired um, i mean you you can hear it on the recording she sounds great um uh, uh, i think after she did i, th I think she she was in them she was in several musicals after that still you know? mm-hmm of course, she's now on television. She's yes. not on musical, but she, she's doing Miss Marple and all those things. You know. That's right, exactly. Salad days. Okay, this is my DJ Mix, um, the two CD set. Uh, I, I, I've always been very, uh, very uh, um, disappointed by some of the rather crude uh, uh, mixing and mastering of all these uh, early recordings uh because they never paid attention to to uh, balancing the voice and the orchestra and, uh, and everything else but of course uh uh all those recordings a lot of them were mono and of course the multi-tracks don't exist anymore so i found i i forced i literally forced my engineer to find me a way to mix those two tracks recordings you know, it's just two tracks Mm -hmm. to mix it, not to master it, but to just mix it. And my engineer kept saying, oh, it can be done. I said, it can be done. If there's a will, there's a way. I kept forcing her. I kept su and then I suggesting her, what if you did this? What if you did that? What if you did that? I won't tell you the secret because it's, uh, it's my, my secret and her secret. What mm -hmm. if you did it? And, and, throughout, uh, and we experimented. And to our shock, it worked. I could met I met we managed to mix two track recordings in which if the voice is too uh, too far too too soft we can we can mix it to, to come to sound louder and if the orchestra is too 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 soft we can make the orchestra louder and, and sometimes we can even isolate certain instruments and, uh, and 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 bring them out you know so that's what I that's 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 the that's the system that um, um, that belongs to us and I've I've called it DJ mix. Now, if you put that cover back, uh, uh, put that, uh, that. The one for salad days? Yes. Now, my present project, now you see the DJ mix on the bottom right. Um, it yeah. says that that's the system, okay? And, um, and, and I'm now on this project. Salad days um, is a second release. Um, I've, on the, 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 the recording on the right, on the left, Belongs uh, is our our modern recording, our contemporary recording, which I did um, uh, in stereo and everything else. And the recording on the on the right, uh, that is the original London cast recording, which is in the public domain. Okay, which means it's out of copyright, and that was recorded in the fifties. It was very crudely recorded and crudely mixed, and the, the sound, the balance is all over the place, and the levels are all over the place between the track, one track and the other track. So I applied DJ Mix. I used my DJ mix on that recording, and it and it turned out miraculously. Now, when you listen to it, everything is beautifully balanced, and the tracks are beautifully ba balanced, and and it sounds sounds like a proper recording. So I've got this series called the two CD uh, set DJ mix two CD set in which I have one a uh, two CD. One CD will be my original um, modern recording, and one will be a, a, a classic a classic DJ mix um, of an original cast recording of the same show. It, it, it will make an interesting listen for, for people to listen to how the original cast recorded and how the revival cast recorded. So I, I packaged those two um, in a two CD set called two, C, two CD set uh, DJ Mix. We started with three as Air, which was the, an English show. 
um, uh, again, that was a Julian Slade musical. I, I recorded a, a recent production and then I used the original London Cut and DJ Mix. We did the, the Salad Days and they've been selling very well. They've been very successful. And now I've just finished um, DJ Mixing and about to release The Boyfriend because I recorded a new um, a, a contemporary version of The Boyfriend, a revival London Cast. And, and I did you mix the original London cast of The Boyfriend, which is sounding great, which I'm really thrilled. So, so we are, we're about to release The Boyfriend, which is the third release of this series. And then we have others coming up. We have um, Velmet and, uh, and uh, Gage the Word, Oliver. I have a modern recording of Oliver and I'm going to did you mix the London cast recording of Oliver. And there's another, uh, here's another so slide. This, for that uh, Salad Days one, yeah, 2020 remix yeah. of the 1954 original. This, That's this, this is a, a, a track where, where I gave the comparison between the original and the DJ mix of each track and, 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 and uh, you know, difference. But but no, no need to play this. Um, if, uh, but that's uh, that, 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 if the goal, you can that really is an amazing process that you've revolutionized with the DJ mix. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very exciting. I can, I can bring out about, I think, I think we have about 20 titles that we can bring out in this series. My new recording and the DJ mix recording. You know? So, um, mm. uh, but, um, but that's, that, 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 that's something which is keeping me busy at the moment. Sure, um, yeah. And I'm what? oh, that's Darren Day. Uh, uh, he did a solo album uh, for me. Darren Day uh, is a big, a big, West End and television star mm -hmm. uh, was. Uh, I think I think he's still known, and um, and um, and we were doing his solo album there. Amazing! Yeah. This is I'm cool. very fun of that. This York promo oh. post, yeah. Well, I didn't know this is this is um, uh, when we did a whole series. These are all the recordings I've done with the York Theater in New York. Uh, we've done about 20 recordings with them, and this is a selection of them. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the York Theatre. Um, uh, and you know, you can see we did um, um, the musical musicals and the Ross Charles and Sons and Christmas in Hell, which is a wonderful, uh, funny story, funny show. So that, that's the York Theatre series. We did over 20, 20 recordings with them. That's amazing. That's really incredible. Oh, that's the Australian cast of mine, which, which, which we released some time ago, but I did find a whole box uh, of them um, because of the COVID. I've been, we've been clearing the office and everything else, and suddenly there was a whole box. It was a very rare album. It is still, still rare, but, but we still got a few more left. Uh, uh, suddenly, this very rare album that everybody was looking for and couldn't find, I found a whole box of it, you know, a whole hundred of, uh, of, of them. And, mm. uh, and uh, and so um, and so um, right, we cool. put back on put them back on sale. Um, now this was a, this was a, a recording um, that I bought uh, because I needed um, an Oklahoma in my catalog. So I bought this from the the, the the previous people that recorded. It was a live recording, and it was recorded by actually actually a punk label, Stiff Records. Can you believe it? Wow! So the other really? day, I don't know where a punk, uh, uh, stiff records that they just released punk, punk music, yeah, and then they brought a past album. But of course, but of course, the reason why they sold it to me is that having brought it up, they didn't know what, know what to do with it because it just doesn't fit in their catalog. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's another cool photo, a little blurry, but <laughs> it's Ron Barryman. Ah, oh. Barryman hugging me. I had a very saucy, I had a very saucy picture of um, of John Barrowman and me. But okay, I'm there's the sure. sign home we saw. Yeah, that's cool. It's great going down. You know, you you also had a, an involvement with uh, these guys, huh? The Broadway tenors. Oh, the tenors, yeah. Yeah, tell us about that. Huh? Wow, uh, Brent Barrett. Uh, it's a friend of mine, and. Uh, he has a he has a concert series called the Broadway Tennis, which I thought is a great uh, which I thought is a great um, great uh, concept, where he would take four or five uh, Broadway uh, uh, tennis uh, stars 
who are in between jobs and they just go on go to have big concerts around the country uh, sometimes three sometimes four sometimes five uh, it will be the same uh, five because it depends on who is doing what you know uh, at that time so i said to brand why, why don't we uh, why don't we, we do an album for you to do the market uh, uh, during these concerts um, uh, because because you have a pool of broadway tennis a broadway stars male stars uh, and we can just get each of them to sing one song or two songs or duets and and company numbers so that at any one time there'll be two or three or five or two or you know that, that will be in that will be in the concert that you can sell the cds in the concert mm -hmm. and he thought oh, it was a great idea and so and so we recorded that album it was one full time for me of course you know uh, being in that in the studio for the whole week i was one after another of these probably hunks coming in to work with me do they still perform? Do they still do things together, or that were one uh, time event? Uh, I think I think uh, no I, no no I think I think it was an ongoing thing. I mean, the Broadway tennis is is an ongoing um, yeah constant brand uh, occasionally. At the moment, of course, nothing is happening. But nothing is happening. They and they're still selling. Um, mm. And uh, that's a wonderful wonderful project for me because I got all these yeah. wonderful great stars from coming in to, to record with me. We'll have to uh, maybe get the guys on the show as guests. That would be terrific to uh, yeah, get on. Brent, Brent, will be, Brent will be very pleased to uh, to, to, um, to, to to appear, chat with us. Yeah, guys and dolls. <laughs> That's a complete recording of guys and dolls. Uh, now, the picture behind um, has a very um, interesting but rather sad um, story behind it. Uh, I was uh, I was looking I was looking for uh, a, a back a, a back a fifties backdrop backdrop of New York um, uh, for the cover, uh, and uh, and I visited I, I took a took we were in New York actually recording guys and dolls actually recording Greg Adun and, um, uh, and other people, uh, and um, and. We went to the the, the 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 twin towers, one of the twin towers. Uh, went up to the top floor when the when, when, when the lift opened, and there there in front of me was this wall to wall stealing the floor picture of New York in the fifties. You know? So I just took a snapshot of that, uh, a section of that of the picture. And use that for the cover, and that 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 that, that photograph is. Is a remnant of the one of the towers um, in New York, one of the twin towers, and it's of course completely destroyed now. Well. Um, hello. That's very moving. Yeah, that's Can you very, hear very. Yeah, that's very moving. That that's yeah. a beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful tribute in a way to have done that. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. That's we preserve a bit of the of the of the of the twin, one of the twin towers. You know. That's not mine. Phantom and love never dies. No, no I don't write. I don't write that doing that. Uh, but anyway, look, that's the picture behind me. This picture. People were asking about that. I think Merlin in Canada was wanting to know about those pictures behind you because we always have the guests sort of tell us about the room that they're in. Tell us about the room you're in and what they see behind you. My drawing room. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you about the picture, but look at what's behind me. Is that you? Yeah, that's a painting of me. <laughs> it's incredible. Who did that? Uh, a portrait painter. Uh, but um, that picture it's very interesting. I was the weekend guest. Um, I stayed for a few days with Joe Lessa in her um, in her um, um, uh, uh, Hamptons home. You know, uh, I stayed. I, I was very, I was very privileged. She invited me to spend a few days with her at her Ham, uh, Hampton home, um, and um, and um, and she had a lot of beautiful artwork and uh, beautiful paintings. Uh, in in that home, uh, in her home, and what 
the artist, I can't remember his name. Uh, it's actually, it's actually uh, on the back of it. I, I managed to, um, to, I just said to her, oh, I love that painting because it was hanging, hanging on the wall. Uh, and then she said, oh, yeah, the artist. And, and then I never thought any more of it. And a few, a few months later, two or three months later, I suddenly received this package from FedEx, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that was delivered to me. And it was a gift from Jolessa. She, she saw the painting um, um, in, a, in an auction and bought it uh, and sent it to me. So that's a gift from Jolessa. Um, I can look up the name of the artist, but I can't remember. I have to take it off the wall because it's on the back, I think. What a gift that is, huh? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're very blessed with that. Uh, Fountain Chain 126 asks, John, can you speak about J Records recording of Oliver with the opera legend Josephine Barstow? Such an interesting recording. Did J record the complete score of Oliver? Okay, uh, to answer the, about the complete score, um, it's, um, it's almost complete. It's not totally complete. Uh, it, actually, that recording is based on, um, on the production um, the orchestrations and everything was based on the production that the the the, uh, the, uh, the national youth theater uh, we have a, we have a, 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 a theater company called the national youth musical theater and they did a production and i love i love the orchestrations uh and so i i, I recorded basically a lot of that cast but um uh, uh I think it's almost complete, but it's not complete. It's not totally complete. It's not a double CD. Joseph in Barstow. Um, <laughs> at that time, um, I was. Um, she, you know, Joseph in Barstow is one of our, our great operatic English operatic star. Okay, Very she's sure. famous for her, for her Verdi and and, and, uh, um, and Strauss and you know, Verdi particularly um, uh, portrayals. Um, and so I recorded as uh, an, um, uh, an album of Verdi Arias with her, which I, I, because at the time, even EMI, they were, they, were, they were, for some strange reason, they all overlooked the British artists, British stars, but they kept recording foreign, German, French, American stars, but not British stars. And I thought, I thought it was such a remiss, um, um, remiss to um, not to record and preserve Joe Barstow's um, Broadway, uh, uh, very, very, very um, interpretations. And so I recorded her and she was very uh, uh, grateful now because she's one of our great dramatic actresses as well as the singer because she worked with her voice, uh, the drama. I thought, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to do an operatic Oliver because at that time, uh, opera, operatic casting for musical theaters were very popular sometimes mostly misguided um, and um, and so I said okay I'm gonna do an operatic Oliver okay so I convinced Joe Barstow I mean of course the first two Barstow said oh, you're mad John you're crazy I can't sing that so of course you can and I I used my persuasion and in the end in the end I persuaded her and okay to someone who is who is still who is used to listening to musical theater versions of Oliver. Oh, you'll find it very odd to hear Josephine Barstow and the opera. Well, the others are, 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 more, are, are more akin because, because um, uh, Bill, um, Bill Sykes could be somebody, an opera singer. Um, uh, had, um, the, um, the, the role, um, well, the, boy, the, the voice is in One Boy, Boy for Sale. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, he needs an opera singer to sing it properly, you know, because it's mm -hmm. very high. But Joe Barstow, uh, she sang it, uh, you know, uh, with her with her sort of uh, dramatic voice, dramatic soprano voice. But and, and she and she really went for it. Um, and I thought she was fabulous um, as Nancy in, in, uh, as an opera singer with, uh, and brought in uh, the, uh, the, the operatic element as well as the dramatic element. So, uh, but 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 granted, some people um, may find it um, a bit odd, 
But I do have a second Oliver uh, recording, which I had Sally Ann Triplett, who just did Nancy in the production. I got her and, and some other musical theater stars to come in and, and re-recorded uh, their roles in the more traditional musical theater way. But I love that Oliver that with Josephine Barstow. And it's very interesting because of the operatic, um, because of the operatic um, um, involvement with the Oliver, Lionel Bart for the first time in his life uh, was entered into a classical catalog. And his wow. name is like Bach and Beethoven. You get Bach and then you get Bach and then you get Beethoven. So that recording is in the classical catalog. Uh, but Lionel Bart for the first time ever, his name is sandwiched between Beethoven and, 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 <laughs> and Johannes and Bach. That is so, amazing. Yeah. Here's another great shot. <laughs> Everybody's waiting for your reaction. <laughs> Is it going to be oh no or uh oh? <laughs> okay, um, that's um, that's, um uh, we when we did um uh, something afoot, um, and that's the that's the uh, something the something's afoot, yeah. Something's afoot, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. a composer, and then uh, in the middle and. Most of the lyricists and book writer, and um, and the, the man on the on the right um, is the uh, husband of one of the co-writers, who's who's no longer with us. You know? Yeah, that's a wonderful shot of all of you. I love this one again too. That's a great, lot of happiness <laughs> there, huh? Uh, and this one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one again. Tell us again who we're looking at for the audience in case they're not sure who they're seeing. Oh, that's Maria Friedman. Right. You know, she's, um, that's me and Julia McKenzie and Maria Friedman. That's Julia McKenzie. We were all having fun in the studio. Oh, that's Sally Ann Triplett. Uh, she, was, she was doing Mrs. Lovett in the New York, uh, the off-Broadway production of Sweeney Todd. Mm -hmm. And... Sally's a dear friend of mine, and so I visited her, saw the show, and she's about to slit my throat on the chair. <laughs> because in the theater, in the, in the theater uh, there, there is this photo section right. with, with the barber chair, and, and so I sat on the barber chair, and Sally, Sally was, Sally, Sally was um, oh, that's Brent Barrett. There's Brent, yeah, she they were talking about Brent theater. earlier. Where was that picture taken, that photo? That's the in the the lock cabin uh, in uh, New York. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. that, studio, that studio is um uh, is called Manhattan Center, and um, and um, uh, the lock the studio belongs to the Moonies, you know. Oh no no okay. no the, the Manhattan Center belongs to Manhattan. the Moonies. Right. The studio is just one of the uh, one of the uh, studios up up in the uh, on the fourth floor. That's a you great know, photo. We are recording um, the Broadway tennis there. Speaking of which, okay. yeah, that's uh, that. Those are the other guys of Broadway tennis. That's Alan Campbell on the um, on on my on my side, and that's um, Al, uh, oh God, what's his name? Uh, uh, Kavanaugh, isn't it? Um, I think it's uh, uh, Kavanaugh uh, on Brent's side. Very nice. That's a great shot there too. Here's another one. Ah, that's uh, that's um, uh, it wasn't Broadway tennis. It was um, it was um, uh, it was uh, a show called Red. R R R E D. Do you know who that is? You know, it looks so incredibly familiar. Yeah. Who is? It? You know? You well, I have you. I mean, he's a dear friend, and my mind. <laughs> yeah, I know he looks to... so incredibly familiar. Maybe oh, he's born as one he's of our. A great star. He, he's yeah. in. He, he was in lots of Broadway shows. He actually was in um, the Prom on Broadway. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe one of the lovely viewers to, can type in. I have to. Look, I have to look up. Hang on. So incredible. I'm, I'm sorry. I hope he's not watching this. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Look at this happiness photo. Lots of happiness and lots of levity in this photo. 
you know you know what that is that is yeah. tell us hang on let, let me tell you let me tell you the uh, the, the name of, of, uh, of uh, oh oh i'm so ashamed of myself are you googling it <laughs> just looking at that, oh, that you know there's there's a lot of photos you're looking uh hang on. fountain okay. says is it christopher yes yes christopher, christopher. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Chris. Just Thank you, Fountain Seba. Chain 126. You win. Fountain Chain yeah. 126. Good for you. That is Okay, funny. and go back, to the, uh, go back to the group photo. Bernadette, Bernadette that, is saying no. great photos. And Merlin in Canada is saying, he is so interesting to listen to. I love his attitude. She likes the, uh, you're, she finds oh, you very cool. interesting to listen to. She loves your attitude, John. Thank you. Now this is uh, the recording for Closer Than Ever. That's uh, uh, David Shire on the left, and that's one of the musicians, and that's Christian Noll in front. That's Sal, Viv Sal Vivano um, uh, behind Christian Noll, and behind Sal is Josh Devosky, and then that's Richard Maltby, and then then that's Jean, um, um, uh, Jean, um, uh, Jean, I'll come back to, and that's me. And um, and those 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 two are musicians. One of the oh the the, the, the girl next to me is um, Jane Corella. Um, Jane Jane Corella uh, uh, is in Richard Morby's arms. Fantastic, fantastic, good stuff. We've got more. This is really cool. I mean, it's an extraordinary uh, career that you've had and continue to have. Okay, that's again uh, the composer for something's the foot, and um, and that's the uh, uh, Jim um, uh, Jim Dale, and mm. and uh, that's another um, another writer for something's the foot, and that studio is in New York. Uh, at, again, it's the, the log cabin. The log cabin, we, right? We uh, we recorded Jim Dale's um, epilogue. Uh, for something to foot. Ah, that's uh, that's the South Pacific. On the right is Justino Justino Diaz, one of the world's great um, baritones. Um, and that's um, and that's um, uh, uh, Joe O'Hara, a uh, Pete O'Hara, who sang who sang um, uh, Nelly for me. And of course, Paige did play did play Nelly and. Uh, Okay, that's Jan Gambatesi and Matt Bogart. Uh, Matt is a dear, one of my dearest friends. I'm actually working on one of Matt's uh, third solo album at the moment. And Jan just did the, the Rogers and Hammerstein album for me. And, oh, that's Joanna Ampel. Again, uh, we, we recorded uh, her solo album at Abbey Road, Abbey Road Studios. Uh, uh, Ted Chapin on, <laughs> on the right, and John Malcherry uh, on the left, and next to me, guess who that is? That's the great Hans Bialik, the oh, orchestrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were recalling on your toes. Mm. Uh, at that time, because uh, as I said, I, rec I released Rambo, I think I was releasing a lot of soundtrack albums as well. Mm -hmm. And the Paramount uh, T-shirt was a gift from Paramount Pictures when I visited them. Mm. That is a great, great, great shot there. That's a really, really yeah, cool one. Yeah, I was, I was, okay, that's um, uh, uh, Nancy Nancy Anderson. Interesting. That's a recording that um, that um, that has yet to be released. Um, it's a York oh. Theatre recording. Uh, it's um, it's based on the on the, the writings of Eugene UNESCO. It's called UNESCO Pay. A wonderful review of uh, of uh, of all the songs based on Eugene UNESCO's um, writings. Mm. That's fantastic. One of the cast. that hasn't been released yet. That's another one to come. Ah, Julia McKenzie. Now. Uh, 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 I met with Julia McKenzie. I uh, met her there. We went. We were, we were, we were at a concert by um, um, Lorna Dallas, 
uh, in London at the cabaret, cabaret room, and Julia was one of one of the the the, 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 the audience, and I was, and so we just decided to pose for old time's sake. Mm hmm. Lucky stiff. Lucky stiff. Oh my God. That's uh, <laughs> what's his name. Um, um, uh, God. One of your one of your listeners could tell me. Uh, it's very famous. It's a, it's what a are the viewers? Fountain chain one two six. I need to look up um, lucky stiff. <laughs> Um, it's terrible. My memory is going. There's a group shot too. Uh, that's Lynn and Steve, my dear, my dear friends. Um, I've done quite a lot with Lynn and Steve actually. Uh, lucky Steve. Malcolm Gatz. There you go. Malcolm Gatz and uh, Janet Metz. Um, that's Janet Metz. Janet Metz. How do you pronounce that? I mean, he's that. Martin Dooley knew that, said Malcolm. Yeah, Malcolm, yes, yeah. <laughs> Martin, du Martin uh, Malcolm gets. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's one for uh, Martin and one for Fountain Chain 126. They're even 50 50 right now. <laughs> and, well, and again, again, well, there's so that's, many people and so many, you know. Yeah. And that's the group well, shot of everybody. I've done several albums with Lynn and Steve. Of course, I did The Wonderful Man of No Importance. Yeah. And Dessa Rose and um, ah, Matt Bogart. I love Matt. What was happening here in this photo? What were you guys doing? We were recording one of his solo albums and we were just uh, discussing on how he should sing it. Yeah. This was Abbey Road, actually. Matt came over to do it at Abbey Road. That was at uh, Abbey Road Studios, yeah. Abbey Road Studios, yes. Quite a place, absolutely. Quite a place. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a great shot, too. You guys look very intense. Are you listening to uh, the playback? Is that what you're doing? I think they're listening to the playback and following yeah. the score. Yeah. You know? Um, Okay. Oh, these are my wonderful, my, my best friends. That's Ron Rains on the left. Uh, that's that's his wife between us, Adonna Ron. And behind me is a tenor, um, uh, Kang 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 uh, Kang Kong. I right? think Kang Kang Chang. I can never pronounce his name. Uh, he's from China. Wonderful tenor. Um, and uh, and then um, uh, on, on the left, um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful mezzo soprano. Um, she has just done um, she has just done um, uh, the leading role of Phaedra in a contemporary opera at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. She was the lead, and she was um, uh, she was the pupil of Donna. Donna Donna teaches voice and um, and, and she directs opera in New York. Mm. And, um, and and she was one of her students. Um, okay, that's one of them. One of the uh, engineers with me. Uh, I can't remember what we were recording, but we were working on something. Yeah, uh, Scottboro Boys, Abbey Road. Yeah, yeah, it could be Scottboro Boys. It could be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The London cast. Ah, that's the Scottboro Boys. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, posing just outside Abbey Road. That's the entire cast of the, the entire London cast of the Scottsboro Boys. For those of you, one. I did both yeah. the London Broadway cast of uh, the off Broadway cast and the London cast of the Scottsboro Boys. Um, I did I did the Broadway and the London cast of the Rink. Uh, John Candy has been very good, very lucky for with me uh, and good for me because that's Candy, Candy, Scottsboro, New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what I was whispering to you. What was that? Postman, poet? Yes, that's Joanna M. Pill, uh, Ethan Freeman, and um, the the guys are the the writers. And where that's was this one taken? Angel Studios. Mm. Unfortunately, you, Angel Studios is no more. There's no more now. But you sure you sure do you sure do get around, John. <laughs> you sure do get around. 
I love yeah. working. Uh, I love working with Angel Studios because it's only five minutes walk from my house, you know, yeah. and um, and it's a converted church. It's so still there. Studio is still there. They're still, they're trying to rent out. They're trying to rent it out as a studio. The reason why it's no more is that the original owners, the owner of the studios, they don't yeah. own the build, own the studios. It's still uh, they're there. Yes. And, and the wife didn't want to carry on. Mm. Uh, there is a question that did come in, which uh, I think is a great one from Fountain Chain One Two Six. John, is there any recording? that you always wanted to do for J Records that you never got to do, perhaps a classic musical? Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, interestingly enough, that one of two, um, I always wanted to do a recording of Hello, Dolly. But, uh, but I know that I know that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, I get the rights to do that. And, um, and, um, I would love to do a recording of a love life. If only, if only to complete my Kurt Vile canon, you know, because I have the only real complete recording of Lady the Dark and One Touch of Venus. And, um, and I did, I've done the complete recording of Street Scene and I've done a, a, a Three Penny Opera. It would be nice to do um, the other legendary recording uh, show of it. Love life, but I don't think I don't think I, I've got the, got, the, got the resources, the time, or the or the, or the stomach to go and do another one. <laughs> no. yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, and we saw that one. That was a good one too. Um, when you look back at these, I mean, these are amazing shots with amazing people you've had an opportunity to work with. Here's another collection of uh, material. Ah. Of course, Mary Lee, that's a complete recording. Uh, I, I'm very pleased with that because uh, George Firth loved that recording. Um, you know, this is the new version, which I think is the published version now. Um, uh, the one that is, that is got to keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And now, and now they, uh, they're publishing. Um, um, uh, that's the one that's published. That's the pajama game. That's a complete recording of the pajama game. And I had um, Tim Criswell, Ron Rains, um, Judy Kay um, in that class. Martin Dooley asks, John, can you tell us a little about your recording of Merrily We Roll Along? I think it's yours. Yeah, this is mine. Uh, I recorded it. It's complete. It's a, it's a cast album, original cast album from the uh, Dester Haymarket Theatre production. And it actually features Evan Pappas and Maria Friedman and a few others West End names. Uh, the reason why I recorded that was that this was the first time that this new revision by Sondheim and, and, um, and Josh Firth was premiered. Um, I think they did a, they did a, a kind of a run um, somewhere, not a run, but a, 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 a presentation in New York somewhere. But this was the first full production of it. And basically, it's it's um, it's a um, a um, and Jacqueline Dankworth, of course, the daughter of Cleo Lane, she's wonderful in it too, and Louise Gold, who is uh, who is a wonderful um, West End artist, she's in it. But uh, but I record it because it's a new version, and I and I suspected that it will be the published version, and I believe that it is the published version. Uh, I've got to change location. I, I would love to carry on talking if if you want to carry on talking. But, but my battery is running down. I've got to change location. You won't see me quite as clearly. Okay. Your battery is uh, because the Yeah. Light, yeah tell, while, you're do, while you're doing that, tell us, give us a little tour of what we're seeing. Okay. Um, wow. Uh, of course, I've repositioned the. the I don't, I don't, I don't think I can show you much, really. I can show you this piano. It's a beautiful home. Yeah. Uh, where is the? Uh, I can show you this piano. And um, that's a piano, yeah. John Kander uh, played on this. Charles Strauss played on this piano. Um, 
And that's my uh, drawing room. Okay. Very beautiful. Um, uh, so I, I've got to stay here. I hope I, I hope I'm bright enough. Am I bright enough? Oh sure, yeah, we can see you. Yep. Okay. Uh, because perfect. I need. I need to connect this to the um, charger. You don't, you don't know how many times <laughs> on our show our guests wind up exhausting all of their battery power because we have such lengthy conversations, bringing back the yeah. sort of conversation, which is fantastic. It's just it, it it's just funny that <laughs> uh, Kathy Short, who's in Cleveland, Ohio, says that's a beautiful piano and a lovely home. And Kathleen in New York City says... The Grand Tour, loving the tour, Fountain Chain, one through six. John on John on tour. I love the beautiful. You you. I love all the, the lighting too. You have lighting uh, positioned. You know the, your architectural background kicks in, and mine is in looking at this. The colors of the wow. walls, the lighting of yeah. the pictures, the the placement of the lamps. Very nicely done, John. What Thank style? You. What style is the what actual? The the house, the structure. The what do they call the house? What is, a, is it? It's a, it's a historical Georgian house, which has which has perfectly um, um, the rooms are, 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 are perfectly sort of um, um, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, the the perfectly sized and uh, what that's a word for it. Uh, my mind is not working today. Uh, Georgian famous for its elegance and it's a very it's a very elegant house and so this is the drawing room um, um, it's a, some eight, 18th century it's 18th century yeah 700, it's the 700 so, and they're, they're the, amongst the most desirable um, uh, houses um, in London uh, if I put this out on the market it will sell immediately because everybody wants to live in a Georgian house and has it's it been Upgraded or restored over the years, I would imagine. A lot of the proportions of the room of Georgian houses are, are perfect. They are, that's why they're, they're famous for their, their proportions of the rooms and the windows. If you, if you look at the uh, if you look at the the windows uh, there, you see the windows. Oh, I, why can't I get it straight? Yeah, you see the windows are perfectly proportioned in that room. Um, I to take that light off. So Georgian houses are the most desirable houses in London. Very nice, folks. Wouldn't you say you're getting a behind-the-scenes tour of John Yap's home, legendary record producer John Yap's home in London, exclusively on the Gym Master Show Live. We take you all around the world, don't we? Those of you watching on YouTube, we would love it if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, share the links we're here every day live with our Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series. Amazing guests from all around the world. Great topics, great conversation, entertainment, and so much more. Beautiful home that uh, we're getting a chance to see there in London as he uh, recharges his systems. Um, great questions coming in from you guys, too. If you want to learn more about the music, get any of the music, the collections that uh, John's talking about, which are incredible and unique, uh, the full works too. You can go to jrecords.com, jrecords.com. And uh, I think his battery just conked out. So he's going <laughs> to, he'll recharge. He's quick. He'll recharge. But uh, amazing, right? He'll be back in just a second. Uh, good question, Tess. Was the home in the family? I'll ask him that if he comes back. Juanita in South Africa, still with us, Juanita. We love it. Beautiful space. Love the lighting as well. I know. Isn't it really nice? Uh, Fountain Chain. Um, Fountain Chain, welcome to the show. Uh, this is probably a new experience for you, but we have been doing these shows uh, since about April. And you can go back in the archives on YouTube and see like 220, 230 past episodes of the Gym Master Show Live. And you'll see us. We always end up in conversations where the guests end up showing us the room that they're in, whether it's a New York City apartment or a London flat or a cottage in Ireland or, a, you know, a penthouse in L.A. or whatever it is. Um, that Georgian house is really, really beautiful. This has been such a lovely chat, Jim. Thank you, Fountain Chain 126. Beautiful home in piano. 
Yep, John Kander played that piano. The tour is incredible. He's right about the proportions. A little of his uh, architecture background he was speaking of, and I was very in tune with that. That's why I wanted to have us see a little bit of the home because as he was walking around, you saw the, the paintings, and I was looking at the color schemes on the wall, uh, the window sizes, as he was talking about, and the choice of lighting and placement of the paintings and photos. Having studied architecture myself, which if I didn't go into television, radio, and the, the background of uh, journalism and entertainment and media and broadcast, architecture and design is something that I also studied that I also really, really enjoy. So getting a chance to see that background was nice. Classically decorated, Bernadette says. You're right, Bernadette. Really, really nice. In a beautiful part of London. Beautiful. And John is such a kind man. I agree. Beautiful home, Kathleen. You are right. Yes, brand new. I've been a longtime fan of J Records, so this has been so nice. Fantastic. Um, again, we originate here in the, in the United States, uh, in the New York area, between New York and Boston, on the southern New England coast. That's where we do this show live. And uh, check out our YouTube channel at Jim Masters TV. Now, I told you that John would be back, right? I mean, home looks very comfortable. I will definitely look back. Thank you, Fountain Chain 126, and tell all your friends about the Gym Master Show Live. Good to have you here. Beautiful home. Beautiful. And John is such a kind man, classically decorated. Yes, and he is back. Everybody uh, lo everybody loves the home. Thank you. <laughs> I actually, actually, sorry, I just shot the whole the whole house uh, because I tried to move a lamp uh, that, that, that <laughs> broke. And, uh, and that lamp shot circuit the whole house. You see, I was going to show the rest of the uh, home, but uh, I'm back, okay. You're back. <laughs> I, was going to, I, was, I was going to tell you about the piano. Actually, the piano belongs to the actress, um, Sean Phillips. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Great. Sean, Sean used to live around the corner from here, uh, from my house, about five minutes walk. And um, and when she moved house, uh, she she, she couldn't take this piano with her. So I said, okay, I'll buy it from you. It's a beautiful broad wood. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. And do you play? Do you, people are asking, do you play yourself? Do you play instruments yourself as well? No, I don't, I don't play. Uh, I, I've, I've taught myself uh, how to score read, but I'm not a musician, you know? So, um, so I, I, obviously from years of recording and, and working with music and I, I read the score. Can you play uh, by ear at all sometimes? You know, can you just by ear? Tinkle. Yeah. In there, you know, but right. No, no. no. But um, here's uh, a question for you from Martin. Can you see it on the screen there? Mm -hmm. Any stories of recording with these artists in a little light? Music? Yeah. I mean, if you want to bear with me, I got I, I got a wonderful story for listening to music to tell if you want me to tell. Sure, yeah, why not? Well, while you have while you have the battery power, we might as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, um, um, when the little Night music uh, transferred from the Chichester uh, Festival Theatre, um, uh, at the time, I I loved the production because a friend of mine directed it, uh, Ian Josh, um, and um, and he directed it like a Mozart um, chamber opera. Um, and the, uh, the new, this one a few times when I actually rather like the new orchestrations uh, because it was the Chichester Festival Theatre and so they couldn't use the original orchestrations. Um, and so they had, that's why that, that's why it was done as a, as a chamber uh, piece. Uh, but the orchestration by John Owen Edwards, who is my, con my who was my regular conductor then, uh, he did uh, Animal and Piso and, and you know South Pacific and Guys and Dolls and all those things. Um, so I wanted to record that when they came to London, and it starred um, uh, it starred um, um, Dorothy Tutin um, and Susan Hampshire and Eric Flynn. Uh, I named those those people because Eric Flynn and Susan Hampshire are on the uh, the, uh, the new recording. So I approached Dorothy Tutin. You know, I don't even know who Dorothy Tutin was. She was one of our great actresses. 
uh, approached uh, her, her agent uh, to make the recording. The agent came back and said, um, oh, thank you, but no, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, thanks very much, but she doesn't want to do the recording. So I said, okay, fine. And then I thought, oh, who should I, who should I have um, to, um, to record? Um, I said, I might as well try for, the, try for the top, you know, try for the best. So I approached Judy Dench. And Judy was, uh, Judy, Judy then said, I would love to do it, John, but she said, it, the, the recording belongs to Dotty. She calls Dorothy Tutin Dotty, you see. Uh, uh, so you should really ask Dotty. I said, I've asked Dor Dorothy and, um, and, um, and she doesn't want to do it. And so Judy said, well, if you, if, if you have asked her and if Dor Dor Dorothy doesn't want to do it, I'll do it. I was thrilled. I got Judy Dench, you know, uh, uh, for the recording, and um, and so Judy started uh, to work on it, and then Dorothy Tutin um, uh, got hold of the fact that Judy Dench was recording it, and apparently she rang Judy Dench uh, because Judy rang me um, uh, the following day and said, "Look, John, I had a very distressing phone call from uh, Dotty, uh, who is." devastated that she's not doing the album and she says the album is mine belongs to me and you know da, da, da. and so i said oh okay and judy said look you know you should ask her and so i asked um i went back to dorothy tutin to her agent and asked her and the answer came back as no she doesn't want to do it so I went back to Judy Dench, and Judy Dench said, look, you know, something is obviously going on. I don't know what's going on, but I don't want to get involved. So I, I, I have to, I, I, will not, I can't do this um, recording, but, but I promise you I will do something else for you. And that's why she is on the cabaret recording. Um, so so um, at that point, I didn't have my desiree. And Sean was a very good friend, uh, is a very good friend, and she was she lived uh, you know as I said a few minutes away from here then, and so Sean, um, I said to Sean, I said, look, Sean, you know, I have I told her the story. I said I have asked Judy and Dorothy, and but um, you know because everything is booked, the studio is booked, the musicians are booked, the rest of it are cast, and and so Sean, uh, I told her the story, and Sean said, okay, I'll do for you, I, I'll I'll do I'll, I'll record for you, um, John. So. So then when, 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 when word got out that Sean was doing it, guess what? Dorothy Tutin rang Sean. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so Dorothy Tutin rang, rang Sean and, uh, and, and, and Sean knowing what, what to expect. So Sean told me this story. She said, she said, when, when she answered the phone, she said, oh, Dorothy, I, she said, Dorothy I'm, I, I, I'm too busy. I'm, I, I can't talk to you now. Bye-bye. She put the phone down. <laughs> so, he had no Dorothy Tutin had no chance of saying the same story to Sean, you know, and that's why Sean was on. But there is another story actually about uh, about the recording. I um, at that time I recorded about three or four albums with Elizabeth Welsh. Do you know who Elizabeth Welsh is? Was she of was course, she was yeah. she is a legend, you know. She's yeah. In fact, in she's American. She was American, but but right. she's dead now. Uh, uh, Frank Rich, I think, um, call her a national icon, a national yeah, treasure, right, right, and right. she claimed her back and everything else. But but Elizabeth Elizabeth was was great, I became great friends with her. Did four five albums with her, and so I um, I um, I thought, okay, I asked her to do Madame Anfield, and um, at first Elizabeth was uh, was very very um, reticent about it. She wasn't keen to do it because she. She said, "Look, John, that song liaisons. I can't get a grip on it because I like to. I like to have my song with a beginning and a middle and an end. The song just goes on, you know. Um, right. Uh, uh, and so, and so, I really can't do justice to that song. I said, but you will. You know, we get involved. We we we, we rehearse and we, we work with you. And and it took me several attempts uh, to get her." And finally, when I got her, and when I told Steve uh, Sondheim that I got the Elizabeth World from Adam and Phil, Steve was shocked. He said, John, how did you manage to do to, to convince her? He said, because all these galas, you know, over the years, 
or the Sondheim tribute and so on. They've all wanted to have Elizabeth Welch to sing the liaisons, and they never got her. She, mm. she turned them all down. In fact, Elizabeth did show me a letter uh, written by Steve to her, asking you know if she would do um, uh, uh, appear among the galleries uh, for um, Liz, well, to sing the liaison, and she never did. Um, uh, she she turned him down. So it's, it's a how do you manage it? You know, a little bit of gentle persuasion, perhaps. But <laughs> it's, it's basically, I think it's basically she just felt that um, the fact that I've done about five albums of hers and a bit of royalty and a bit of payback, perhaps. Um, but I'm sure that she did it because it's a very, she, she was a very unusual, um, very different metal uh, 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 in the years. So that's you my know, story for. I was going to say, there's another way to also describe you, and there's a theme running through this whole wonderful epic conversation on the show. Uh, I think in addition to saying legendary record producer, we could also call you the master of gentle persuasion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, know. I mean, there's definitely quite a lot of persuasion. That I, that I a lot of opportunities <laughs> to bring that forward, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, which, which I've been very the, lucky. I have to say, I've been very, very, very lucky uh, in my. I mean, as a, as a young child growing up in Malaysia, looking up at all these names, all these legendary names that were just on record sleeves, and so never did I realize that when the, that I eventually became friends with them. You know, yeah. I set up dinners and they came to my home, and you know, and I came to their home. Um, uh, would would but, have. So I was, yeah, I mean, would this person in this picture here with his mama ever dream of the career turning out the way that it did? And no. the life that has, uh, no. no. Did your mother, no. did your mother, is your mother still with us or did she get to no, see, no. Some of this, did she get to she see did. some of your success? She did, she did. Oh, but, uh, good, yeah, good. But, uh, but she's, she's passed some time ago. So she, but she did get a chance to see some of the, yeah. the success from these early yeah. years and the dreams that you've had, which is a very beautiful thing, you know. It's a really. Yeah. She always believed in you, right? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. She, 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 she was never judgmental. Uh, you know, I, I even, even I, I realized I was gay from that age, young age, um, and 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 and. I was very lucky that, that I was never judged. I was never, you know, my, my parents would just let me be, um, you know. Um, so uh, I was never sort of, uh, I never felt guilty and never been made to feel whatever. It, it was always whatever, whatever it is, it is. It's but nice, um, it's nice that you had support yeah. from family like that. Sure, absolutely. It was, it was amazing. My brothers and sisters, all of them, you know. Uh, uh, I did have boyfriends um, uh, when I was very young, and, mm. and I used to. You know, they, they were much older than me, but uh, I mean, they were like senior boys when I was at, uh, at, at school at nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I had sort of boyfriends who were in the senior, the fifteen, sixteen year olds, and used to bring them home and things, and they were fine. Uh, Suzette's so, watching. She says, "Good evening from Portugal." Portugal is watching too. Nice I to see you. Portugal. Yeah, it's beautiful. We got Portugal, Juanita in South Africa, Carla in Brazil, and <laughs> it's an international Wonderful. audience. Wonderful. Yeah, but there's this too. But, uh, uh, that was that, that's the first of my two CD um, um, uh, DJ mix. The the one on the left is my new recording, and the one on the right is the um, is the original London cast, which I DJ mixed it. But you know, I, I I have to count my blessing. I mean, like yes. for example, no one can whistle. Um, uh, it's just amazing that uh, that that it turned out turned out to be so wonderful. Um, I mean, Sondheim is completely uh, bowled over by it. It's in fact Sondheim in uh, this year's Christmas present that Sondheim gave to all his friends uh, was a little bit of music. I I think because. He kept asking for more and more and more copies because he said all these friends and associates they, they hear they, they hear it and then they want it and and so i kept sending him copies uh, he took over 100 copies of um, to give to his friends for christmas and 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 for sondheim to 
offer an endorsement for the recording. Um, he, um, he, you know, Songham never endorsed any recording, never publicly say, you know, put it on no. down. But he, I, I was, I was, I was, I was surprised. I was, I was, I was obviously delighted when Songham said, "I will write you an endorsement, John." Mm. And when the endorsement, I mean, he I said, "Songham's endorsement was this: the brilliance of this recording." Has has uh, has more uh, the brilliance of this recording for the show has made the show has more um, no what was it the brilliance of this recording I need to I need to look it up I need to quote him correctly. You want to have it exact, right? Just the fact yeah. that he even took the time to do that, Stephen. I, I mean, I mean to, to offer he offered to to write an endorsement for. He said, "I write an endorsement for the for the outside and the inside of the book list." Um, so <laughs> that's um, amazing. You are blessed. And, uh, and um, um, uh, the brilliance of this of this recording has more. Okay, the brilliance of this recording. Uh, I must I must get it right. I can't I can't misquote him. And Suzette, okay. yes, from Portugal, and tomorrow I'll be here again. Fantastic, Suzette. Welcome to our show. Welcome to our show. And uh, has Julia heard the new recording, John, from Fountain Chain 126? Yes. Yeah, she's thrilled by it. Of course, she is. Absolutely. Now, the, 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 the endorsement the brilliance of this recording gives the show more energy and sparkle than it ever, than it's ever had. Now, this is the line. It has made me, it made me proud of it. Yeah. So when you hear that, how does that make you feel? I was just over the moon. I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, all these years from 1964 to now, there's always been a bit of a hold back and so on. And finally, he is proud of anyone can whistle. You know, this recording made him proud of it. Because this recording has brought up so much more of what the show really the brilliance of the show i mean now people don't talk of it i mean i mean like i obviously get a lot of a lot of response and feedback people are talking in terms of it's one of sondheim's masterworks masterpiece sometimes um, you know it's no longer the 1964 flop it's now uh, uh, one of his masterpieces and one of his brilliance and and um, political satire rather than a flop mm -hmm. now the bigger the most, uh, the most uh, uh, amazing um, uh, uh, accolade from Sondheim regarding this recording was um, when um, on Thanksgiving Day, because we were corresponding and talking to each other a lot, on Thanksgiving Day I received this uh, email from him, and he said, "Dear yeah, John, he said, um, on this Thanksgiving Day I want to thank you and give thanks to you because." You have made a feast out of a telkey. Wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, that, that, that I couldn't I, I was I was I was so moved by that, you know. Um, and, um, and and of course Sonheim being Sonheim, he knows how to use words. Well, I told you as well that on our show the viewers call themselves Lovities. They call me Mr. Lovity. They call the Gym Master Show Live Lovity Hall. And mm -hmm. I think about an hour or two ago, they said what I mentioned to you they were going to do. They said, you are now one of our Lovities. Okay. So Merlin in Ontario, Canada says, how does being a Lovity on the Gym Master Show Live make you feel? <laughs> wow, I it's great. Almost, almost as good as when I received the endorsement from Sondheim. Perfect answer. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> Being a lovey for legendary record producer John Yap, almost as good as getting the endorsement from Stephen Sondheim. Is that not amazing? Yeah. That's, that's a true yeah. lovey right there in London. Yeah, yeah. It's been, I, I'm really having a great time. I could, I, I can talk for five days if you want me to talk for five days. <laughs> <laughs> because I, uh, I do have, I do have, a lot, I do have a lot of stories to tell. But 
but uh, yeah. but I think it's going to take another week. Five hours. Well, we could always have you come back, especially when you release. You have so many wonderful projects that you can't mention now, but that are coming forward. So we could always have you come back. Suzette watching in Portugal says, I love your shows and the guests you choose. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Suzette. I'm glad to know you're watching there. Uh, you've Thank been you. given the Loverty Award. Bernadette has given you and all of us the Loverty Award from us to you. Um, when, you. when you look at this career, this body of work, all these experiences, all these people you've had an opportunity to work with here in the United States, there in Europe and elsewhere, all the projects and knowing that you have this keen ability to take work. I know when you have these works placed in your possession, the, these incredible shows and these plays and these all this music that you pay such respect and pay heed to the history of it all and what it's all about. So when you are uh, crafting these and, and bringing these back and, you know, presenting to us the complete works done in such a beautiful way, um, you understand the responsibility very, very deeply that you've been tasked with to present this work as authentically as the original, but then again with the enhancements, so it's, uh, you know, in a complete way now. Uh, this is something that is really deep in your heart and your soul, the work, the career, and the effort that you take to present all of this for the pleasure of all of us, right, John? Yes, absolutely. I, uh, I, the thing is that it has paid off handsome, handsomely for me uh, uh, doing what I did because I never chose to do uh, a recording of a work based on money, based on making money. I. Everything I've, I've decided to do is because I thought it deserved to be preserved. It deserved to be done and presented, um, uh, and then. But collectively, um, it's kept me, given me a very good lifestyle. It's given me a, a very rich lifestyle, and it's given me enough um, uh, resources to carry on doing, um, carry on doing. Um, uh, uh, what I love best, and and I feel a very bad. good lifestyle and a very rich lifestyle. I failed to mention that I'm your third cousin. <laughs> <laughs> when I say I rich, I don't, I don't mean money. I mean richness. Mean, right. Yeah. Right. But, but I, I really do feel really blessed because, like for example, my 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 new recording of the Fantastics. So uh, I've done, mm. I've done. I, basically, I've done a recording of Fantastic, but I'm going to re, I'm going to recast it because it was done with an English cast very quickly for a, a special project. But I've recorded. It's a very basic. It, it's the original uh, original orchestrations. Uh, the original orchestrations are only basically a piano, harp, um, um, uh, piano, harp, and a bass. I think. Um, uh, so I've got the, I've got all the tracks um, of the whole show. All the underscoring and everything, but um, but I was going to going to finish it with the English cast, but I'm going to redo it now uh, with an American cast because when I did uh, the recording of um, Merman's Apprentice, uh, there was this young little girl uh, who I think she was only 14 when she when she did the recording called Elizabeth Tita. Uh, as coincidentally, uh, it was a wonderful coincidence. Elizabeth Tita is the daughter of um, Lara Tita. And when Lara was a Broadway uh, um, star, uh, he did uh, On Your Toes on Broadway. And I recorded On Your Toes. And I worked with Lara Tita. Um, uh, and I recorded him. And, um, and so there I was recording, uh, many, many years later, recording his daughter, 14-year-old uh, Elizabeth Tita, whom I recognized and immediately recognized and, 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 and realized that she was a major talent. And now because she was so wonderful in her acting and her voice and everything about her is just amazing. And of course she was amazing because since then, even at that tender young age, she's done several Broadway shows or Broadway plays. And she's been in a lot of Broadway plays. They kept casting her. And now she is like 18 or 19 
And when when I was doing when I was doing uh, Mama's Apprentice, uh, I just fourteen, him. Uh, I would, I, take, I I told myself when she grow when she grow a little bit uh, older, and when the right work comes along, I will work with her again. And um, and so I um, I um, uh, have now cast her to sing Louisa in the Fantastics. Um, she will be the right age for Louisa, well, 18, 19, but 19. Wow. She will be the youngest and the most, most age appropriate Louisa of all. That's and, exciting. And I've got, and I've got, um, I've got um, a lot of people, I can tell you who, 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 who I've found so far. I have um, um, uh, Terry Loon, uh, Terry Loon, the Chinese um, star, he's going to be the boy. And I've got uh, Ron Reigns, uh, one of the father. And um, and uh, I'm looking for, for um, uh, what you call diverse casting for the other father. Uh, yeah. I, shouldn't, I shouldn't mention El Gallo. I got him, but I won't mention him. He'll, he'll be a very nice surprise. Be a nice surprise. So then, I wanted to do. I wanted to do something with, uh, with Elizabeth Teeter, and and here it is. We are, we are all lined up to go into the studio to to record uh, the fantastic, the complete recording with uh, with the whole work, all the dialogue and everything. And Tom That's Jones right. is going. To, Tom Jones is going to direct the uh, the scenes. It should be good. You know what that's going to be? That's going to be fantastic. But, but <laughs> More than fantastic. It will be, be fantastic when we when we get to uh, when we get to um, to get into the studios. Yeah, when we be able to get back in. You know, I imagine as these opportunities continue to come your way to work on all these massive and major and uh, historic projects, which they are. It's almost like being a little kid in a candy store, right? You get all excited about it because you know, you get to work on these things and bring these things yeah. back to life in their entirety. That must yeah. you must feel like a little kid in in a in a toy store, right? Wow, I get to play with this toy and work on this, right? It must be exciting. Well, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, for many many years I was like that, but now I think I'm a bit of a veteran. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're an adult kid. <laughs> uh, I'm an adult kid, so moderately excited. No, I'm of course I'm very excited. Sure. They're still in, they're still my little babies. You know, they're all my babies. My children. they're all your babies, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Merlin in Ontario, I, Canada has a question. She's asking, would you ever consider doing it with Greece? I've done a Greece. You've should done I've Greece. Yeah. Greece. There you go. With There's your the answer, Merlin. Experiment. Uh, well, my Greece, my Greece is that although I did record the film songs um, and interpolated them, but I recorded the entire original um, uh, off Broadway version. But I wanted my Greece to go back to the off Broadway version, which was which was a charming, sweet, wonderful, inventive uh, '50s uh, rock and roll musical. Not one of those overblown Paramount Pictures, um, John Travolta, uh, Greece. So, so my Greece, I went back to the, um, the original, the, uh, the original intent. Right. Uh, but I did, I, I did record the uh, uh, "You're the One That I Want" and Greece, the title number, as part of it. But, the, but the main, the whole record, the main recording is very much back to the original. And I did the same with the Rocky Horror Show. Um, uh, I recorded Rocky Horror Show complete, uh, and, I, and I recorded it with the original um, uh, of original Fringe version, um, which is uh, which, which actually I, I, I did I did see it when it first came on at the um, theater upstairs Royal mm -hmm. Court as one of those. Tiny little uh, 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 theater upstairs uh, from the of the Royal Court Theater, which is the legendary theater. But there was this new musical called the Rocky Horror Show, and and so I thought I'll go and see it, and 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 I um, and I um, I went to see it, and I loved it. I absolutely thought it was amazing. It was very raw. It was uh, it was very off Broadway and and very fringy, but very raw. 
and uh, and I loved every. I wanted to do the class album, but I, I, I never. I, at that time, I, I wasn't really doing it. I, I was desperate to record it, but then of course it it went on to Great Afraid, and now of course Rocky Horror Show is a big kind of big event thing. Uh, but my 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 recording of the Rocky Horror Show is um, is um, um, is the original um, back to the original of uh, fringy version. But I was also very lucky in that I, I, I do have uh, Brian May, the guitarist of Queen. Uh, you know the Queen, the pop group? Yeah, sure. Very Freddie Mercury, that whole group originally. Yeah. Wow. He, play, he, he, sings, um, uh, he sings one of the songs and played the guitar on the song. Is it, um, is it um, uh, Eddie or one of the uh, Saturday? Uh, What's the character? The character that um, he has a rock and roll song to sing. He did sing that song for. He did record. So I had Brian May on my on my, in my catalog. That's fantastic! Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I do things like that, which, which yeah. is because I I sort of, I sort of revisit my, my 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 younger days where I was knocked by 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 the original version of Rocky Horror Show. And so I wanted to record it, but I didn't want to record that the overblown version of the original. And mm -hmm. you know, the same thing with, with a lot of other things, like the reason why I recorded 110 in the shade, the complete version of it, uh, um, uh, a complete recording of it is, I remember seeing 110 in the shade soon when I was still at school at, at Bordeaux in, 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 in England, in Ipswich. I used to, Saturday, Saturday afternoons, I used to Sky Falls. Instead of playing games, I used to I used to get the, the, the head prefect to cover for me to pretend that I was there. And I would take the train. That was, I was based in Ipswich. I would take the, 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 the train after lunch straight down to London and go and see a, a, a matinee a show and then take the train back in time for dinner, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and it all worked out, all figured out. I, and every Saturday I used to do that. And I saw 110 in the shade and I loved it so much. So much so that um, when I was able to uh, record, um, um, uh, a complete recording of it. I did it, and mm. and and Harvey Schmidt nice. asked me, well, "Why did you decide to do an independent show?" Is it because I obviously left the show and I wanted to do it? So, you know, yeah, mm. uh, yeah, you so got Bernadette. Like, yeah, Brian May from Queen. Yeah, Bernadette, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I told you, Brian May from Queen. He's on my recording of a lit of the Rocky Horror Show. Well, John, this has been absolutely amazing. Would you believe we've been chatting for about three hours almost? Oh wow! Well, well, that's what that's that's what uh, that's what they said. That's what they said would probably be the case. We said maybe an hour and a half, or nah. What you, I like to create an atmosphere that's warm and inviting, doesn't feel rushed bringing back again, the art of conversation and, you know, there's no time limit. We can go as short or long as we want, as long as the guest has the time and the guest wants to open up and express and we, you know, uh, get a chance to show some visuals and other, you know, goodies along the way. Uh, traditional uh, talk show of the old school sensibility, but with the modern current vibe of today is pretty much what we're doing. And, uh, I hope yeah. you enjoy yourself with us. That's for sure. I love it. I love every minute. How, are you going to play something from anyone from this show? I don't think we have that to play, but we can direct people to the website so they can get it, which is jrecords.com, right? No, www.jrecords.com. J-A-Y records.com. Right there. Yeah, well, so we'll I'm gonna, direct. I'm going to send you... Um, I wonder if I can send you uh, by um, WhatsApp a track. Bernadette says, uh, this has been a great time. Thank you, John and Jim. Suzette okay. watching in Portugal. John, conversation is so interesting. Thank you, John. Uh, Mary Suzette. Bishop in Florida. Wonderful show. Great meeting you, John. Bernadette says, thank you for your work, the work that you've done, John. Kathy in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Ohio, USA. Three hours have flown by. Thank you so much for such an interesting and fun afternoon chat. Kathleen in New York City, thank you for spending time with us, John. This is all the loveities. They love sharing their lovety. And uh, uh -huh. we stay here a long time listening, listening. That's Suzette in Portugal. Wonderful words. 
from everybody. I uh, think that uh, I love uh, I love uh, going to Lisbon. Um, is is that listening? Uh, Lisbon. Yeah, is it, is that listening? I, I just want to say something to her. Suzette, are you there? Oh, from, Suzette. From, from, yeah, uh, in Portugal, right? There she is, yeah. right there, Suzette. Okay. I absolutely love uh, going to um, to Portugal to Lisbon, uh, I, and I've, I've been on the Douro, but uh, but I've been to Lisbon about three times. But I do have to um, uh, to tell you this because. Um, the uh, 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 my first visit there, I, um, I of course I was desperate to listen to a real fado singing, um, and um, and of course uh, I noticed that there were a lot of fado singing in restaurants down in the touristy area uh, where it saw a stage and everything else. But I um, one evening um, at about six six seven o'clock. I decided to walk. Um, uh, to walk. Um, uh, I'm telling you about the, the story about Lisbon. To walk up the old uh, town of Lisbon uh, and walking around there, and then suddenly I realized that uh, that I noticed. Um, well, I was with my partner. We noticed that there were all these locals uh, because the streets were all winding and, and, and undulating and steps. They were all congregating around this area and there's just tiny little restaurants uh tiny, tiny little restaurant with some tables and but all occupied uh we thought we asked them uh why, why are you waiting for oh the lady uh, the lady is about to sing then of course we, 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 we i knew it was father and um and so um and so um i uh, we, we, we found luckily we got we, we found uh, one last table and and uh, of course the father singers uh, they are um, the, the tradition is that widows and women who are who have been jilted or whatever they 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 they, they, they start a restaurant and and then they, they sing the song of songs of lament and then they they they, they, don't, they, they, they wear a kind of a shawl and you know and wear black and, but the father the father songs are wonderful they're all usually start laments and things like that and so i managed uh, and this lady is the restaurant owner and she's a real father singer and 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 they, they had, um, there was a mandolin and a guitar accompanying her and i, I actually experienced a real genuine father singer uh, in in the in a real father surrounding of a restaurant one and cooked by her um it, that was that was amazing that was an amazing experience but Suzette, I love Porto too. I've been She's to near Porto, 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 she said. Yeah. yeah I've been Another... to Porto and I love Porto. Uh, uh, I've been on the Duro twice, uh, the cruise. Yeah. Uh, both times I've been on Porto. Yes. Martin uh, Dooley says this conversation has been wonderful, informative, intimate, funny, and I've got records to buy. So he's going to the oh, website to see Bob. For you. Yes. <laughs> And welcome, Martin. I hope you'll be with us. We're here every day with the Gym Masters Show Live. You can check everything out on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and YouTube, all at Gym Masters TV. And of course, Jay Records is in all those great places as well. Willie, who is uh, just across the water there in Holland, in the Netherlands. She's one of our regular okay. lovelies. She says, thank you for the stories. And uh, Christine Clifton in North Carolina, USA. This has been an epic episode with John. Thanks, John, for preserving so many incredible recordings and shows over the years. What huge blessings, opportunities you've had. And there's more lovity. Suzette in Portugal says, thank you, John. Bernadette Thanks. says, stay safe and stay well, John. Thanks again. What a career. We have Thank more you. coming in here. Merlin in Ontario, Canada says it's been a blast. Juanita in South Africa. Thank you for sharing your fascinating life with us, John. Keep well, stay safe. And uh, Kathleen in New York City, thank you for spending time with us, John. Everybody around the world certainly enjoying uh, this episode of our show and having you as our great guest and uh we'll have to have you definitely come back uh, as you have more exciting I, things I, to I share with lost, us. i have lost more stories to tell 
Liza Minnelli and you know and Leonard Bernstein and oh god. Well, well, that, well that's you another story. Well, you can't tease us. Give us one Liza story. Well, um, well, uh, you know, you know, I recorded Liza in the ring, yeah, and uh, and um, yeah, sure. It was it was quite a, it was quite a, it wasn't her fault, you know. It was it wasn't it, she was totally wonderful, but it was quite an episode getting getting to um, to getting Liza to, um, to 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 agree to doing the cast album of the rink. It wasn't her fault. It's all the people around her, and um, and so but we finally got it, um, and um, she she came to the studios, um, and um, and everybody was there. Cheetah and the cast were all recording, and she came at about eleven o'clock, I think, uh, instead of nine o'clock, and. Um, and so I was. Uh, the, the, the security rang up. Miss Miss Minnelli is on her way up on the lift because we recorded this on the thirty second floor of, of BMG RCA Studios in New York. And um, and then she um, uh, when the when the when the uh, when the um, when the, 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 the door opened, the elevator. She fell into my arms and and, 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 and she just said, "Protect me! Protect me! Protect me!" And he said, of course, we protect you. We're all friends here, but And then <laughs> she said, I can't sing. I've got no voice. <laughs> oh, and so, so she, came, she came to the studios, but she couldn't sing because she said she had no voice. And, uh, and so poor uh, Cheetah had to do everything by herself. And apparently, according to Cheetah, all her recordings, West Side Story, Bye Bye Birdie, she's never, ever done any duet with her co-star. She's always laid down her track first and then somebody and then the post cars uh, would, would, would track her down. But then Liza did come back two days later by herself and um, and she was absolutely wonderful darling. Um, um, wonderful to work with and she, she was totally easy and gave and was very giving. But of course two days or three days later she was she went into the Betty Ford clinic. Uh, and then I think out of the show, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but um, but we were very lucky to have got her when we got her. Otherwise, the the, the Broadway cast, the original Broadway cast album, would not have existed. Okay. Wow, <laughs> that is quite. <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing story and uh, puts a different spin on on some of the events. And, and like you say, oh, speaking of that, before we go, my friend, and again, you're, you're very welcome to come back. Uh, do you see a memoir, an autobiography, uh, telling your stories in a book at one of these days? Well, I, I could write several books uh, uh, over my over my um, my, uh, my career because I have stories from America, I have stories from London. Uh, you know, Mary, the Mary Martin story is another interesting story which I will bore you with. Um, uh, but um, no, yeah, but I don't know if I have the time to write it. You know. It's tell a shame. Mary, it's tell, tell us the Mary Martin story while we're here. <laughs> there, everybody's still here watching and listening from all around the world. You might as well. Mm -hmm. All right. The I mother of Martin. Larry Hagman, the actor. Yeah. yeah that's right. Who they know I from Idris and Jeannie in Dallas. Yeah. yeah. I remember Mama, okay? Uh, I was working with the Rogers and Hemistein uh, organization, and we decided uh, we were casting. This was a, a, a studio cast. Um, this was a studio cast recording. Uh, uh, at first, actually, actually, before Mary Martin, when we decided to do I Remember Mama, uh, we, I I had the audacity to um, I have the audacity to um, to ring up um, um, uh, uh, God my mind uh, yeah. who was well, you're, you're coming up with a lot of names so it's it's it makes ah uh, uh, God oh God <laughs> uh, uh, what's the name I remember Mama um, I had to look up I had to Google Lisa <laughs> Oman. Um, no, um, Omen, um, 
Omen. Um, Martin the, the, Dooley the, the, or uh, Fountain Chain? The, <laughs> no, the, the, the Norwegian. Um, I know who you're thinking about. Leave, leave Omen. Leave Omen, okay? So I rang up Liv Omen. I found her, tracked her down. She was filming in the television studio in uh, in Norway, in uh, in in Stockholm, uh, Norway somewhere, and um, and um, and so she came to the phone. I was surprised. She came to the phone. Hello, this is Liv. She said. She said, and I said, Liv. I said, I, I said, I'm making a recording of um, a studio recording of I Remember Mama. I got Josh Glenn back, and Josh says, uh, um, 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 uh, Back and um, and I would love you to 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 come back and record, oh, Mama. I and mean, then she said, "Oh, I love to, John." She said, "It's a wonderful, wonderful idea." So I said, "Oh, great! I got leave him just like that, you know, telephone call uh, out of nowhere." What is that? But then she said, "Oh, well, you get in touch with my British agent and um, and uh, work it out." So I got in touch with the British agent, who was a friend of mine, uh, and she was very surprised. That, but uh, of course, a few days later, I did get a phone call from the British agent saying. Well, leave. Um, uh, thank you very much, but she she decided not to do it. You know. mm. um, um, but I think I, really, I know the real reason uh, because there was um, a bit of ding dong between her and Martin Shani. Um I think she didn't want to. Um, she didn't want a, a kind of romantic ding dong rather than a bad ding dong. She didn't want to relive that. I don't think. Apparently, I don't know. You know, that was a rumor. But anyway, so we said, oh, we don't have relief. So who shall we get? Uh, Pat Chapin, myself, at the Rogers and we said, well, we might as well go for the go for the top and 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 ask Mary Martin. So we got we got, got in touch with Mary Martin, and and she looked and she decided, and then she did then this then she came back and said, oh, thank you very much. Uh, it was great, like, uh, but I I I don't I don't think I, uh, I'm right for I don't want to do it, you know, because. Uh, Blah, 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 I don't know what, I can't remember the excuse. She, she didn't want to do it. And so we said, oh dear, Rogers and Hammerstein, the Shirley Jones. So we said, okay, we'll, 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 we'll catch Shirley Jones, we'll approach Shirley Jones. So I approach Shirley Jones, oh, love to do it, wonderful, and everything I signed, and, she, and we've got dates for her to come to London and everything else. And so we, we, we've got Shirley Jones agreeing to do the Mama work. And then meanwhile, Mary Martin came back and uh, and uh, she came back and said, "Oh, John, I would love to do I would love to do the Mama recording." And I said, "Oh, um, sorry, but uh, Shirley Jones, um, we have offered it to Shirley Jones, and she uh, and she has accepted." Then Mary Martin said, "Ah, perfect, Shirley Jones will be perfect, and and of course she'll be great for it." And uh, you know, I'm sorry I missed it. Um, and so so we lost Mary Martin, and then of course. <laughs> A few days later, Shirley Jones pulled out, and uh, right. so we got no mama again. And I didn't feel right to go back to Mary Martin, having turned her down. No, oh, yeah, I had to yeah. what did you do? Good friendship. I, I was good friend with Sally Ann and House, and so I approached Sally and House and told her the story and said, "It's fine, John. No problem. I, I'll do that. I don't care being behind Mary Martin and Shirley Jones and Dave Oman." So it's, that's how that's the Mary Martin story. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing, my friend. <laughs> what I, I, got Betty, I got a Betty Davis story. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> For the next we'd episode, love, we'd we'd love we'd love to hear that one. Everybody's on the edge of their seat. Well, Betty Davis, I, I mean, when I was younger, I was really kind of like, I don't care. I would just get in touch with these people, you know? Betty Davis, um, Betty Davis. Yeah. yeah. So I found out that she was through a friend that she was she was staying at the Savoy. Okay. Savoy Hotel in London. And so I, I, I dropped a note to her. I said, I would love to meet you because I have a project I would love to discuss with you. And I heard from her and she said, oh, she invited me to lunch, to dinner, uh, to tea. At her, at her, in her suite, in the, in the, at the boy. Basically, I had this idea of recording her, um, recording her uh, in Miss Muffet, uh, recording a, a, of her. It was never recorded. It was she. I think she. I don't even know if she went to Broadway with it, but it was a musical that she was headlining, and it wasn't recorded. So I went to have tea with her. Um, I 
sat there nervously in her lounge and she came out, you know, after about 20 minutes. I sat there for 20 minutes, came out and said, wow. So, so she can sit down and, and, and I said, you know, I told her I wanted to do it now. And she said, oh, I love to do that, she said, you know. And then we had a nice tea and, and general chit chat. Then she said, well, here are three names that you, you, have, to, um, you have to call and work out a deal with them. Uh, her manager, her agent, and her lawyer. So I got to deal with three of them. Three okay. big ones, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't pay Hollywood stars salary. All, my, all, my, all the people that work that recorded for me, big stars, little stars, well known, they all get the same kind of basic um, uh, favorite nations fee because that's the only way I can, I can do it. I'm dealing with big stars. I can't say I'll, I'll pay you this, but I'll pay you that. I just say everybody, if they want to do it, this is the favorite nation's deal. It's all for posterity, and if you want to do it, you can do it. You know, um, and, uh, and so it, it's not. It's just a bit of money. It, it's quite a lot of money, but it's not the top money. So right. I know that with, with Betty Davis, if I had to deal with her agent, I think I can deal with it. But to deal with her agent and to deal with her. Um, Manager oh, and her manager. lawyer, all three of them. I, I, it was, it was like too much, like hard work. Yeah. And so I, I decided to uh, not prematurely age myself uh, with that project <laughs> because I know that I know that it won't sell, and I won't, and, and I didn't want to insult her or offend her by saying I can't pay you any more than what I pay everybody uh, because it's not going to sell. Right. It will sell to a certain. It will sell to a certain limit. But it's mm -hmm. not going to make money, and so mm -hmm. I just didn't want to get into that, that situation to explain to her why she's not being paid a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars for that, you know. Yeah. So, so that's a better day. This story. That is amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but but I did have nice a nice tea and cakes with Betty Davis in her um, sweet. sweet. Right. Yeah. What a memory. I mean, so that's not something that everybody could say they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful memory, yeah, Betty Davis. Well, well John, I mean, this you know, I, I, as I said, I'm blessed. I, I mean, I rock yeah. this with such a lot of wonderful legends and oh, and sure, major, major, major talents in the world. Yes, absolutely. And again, if people want to learn more and, uh, Get some of the incredible material that J Records has uh, created for the good of all of us. You can go to jrecords.com, and you're looking right now at the owner and creator of J Records and uh, legendary record producer and so much more, the incredible John Yap. John, uh, this has been an extraordinary uh, look, really. You know, you're you're a guest on my show, but a wonderful look at your life as well. And I think people who know of you who know of your work, who've experienced your amazing work, got an opportunity to learn a little, about, a little bit more about the man behind J Records, the man behind the vision and the story and the dream and the passion. Of course, I know it takes a village and you have people that work with you who are experts, your team who works with you at J Records as well, uh, who you collaborate with and, and they're brilliant people as well. But I think on this episode of our show, people got an opportunity to really see the man as much as maybe the, the, the legend, a little bit more about the man and his heart and soul and what drives him all the way from the very beginnings in Malaysia to the extraordinary work that you're continuing to do today, my friend. Uh, this was a blessing. I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed your time with me as much as I have with you, John. Yeah, I love I love every minute of it. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for uh, for tuning in. And I hope I didn't bore anybody, but uh, but uh, you know, but it's just been a blast. It's been wonderful. Uh, now the thing is that um, there is a song from uh, from um, um, from um, something's afoot uh, called news uh, called New Day, which I'm going to uh, which I'm going to uh, send to you by. Um, email oh, that'd be great uh, 
if you if you have an opportunity, it's a perfect song for the twentieth, um, January the twentieth to play. It's a song called New Day from um, from something to foot. It's when you listen to it, and I send it to you when you listen to it, if you find an opportunity to play it um, yes. at some point on the 20th. January when, 20th, 2021, a big day, yeah. Yeah, when, when America indeed enters into a new day. You know, um, well, that, we can hopefully breathe and there's going to be peace once again. And uh, Yeah, well, when I um, that's much more division I mean, and nonsense. I don't know what I don't know what's going to happen here, but I can actually send it by email to you now if you want to play it. Um, well, well, you know what we can do is we'll definitely look towards the twentieth and play it then, because then it might be probably extra yeah. special. Yeah, it'll be extra special yeah. to to have it at that time. Um, yeah, yeah. Berlin, Ontario says so. Enjoyed you, John. And this uh, an amazing tale from Kathy uh, in you. Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Fountain Chain One Two Six. John has brushed soldier. Uh, John has brushed shoulders with everyone from show business. What an amazing life, Christine Clifton. What an amazing story, Martin Dooley. No bore. Fascinating and memorable conversation and stories. Perfect, Martin. That's exactly what I hoped you would get out of the show. And. Um, John, I toast you. I don't have English tea, but I do have coffee. <laughs> and you did a fine job. You moved around the house and you took yeah. us on a wonderful tour and your battery died and you, you got right in there. And uh, yes, the, they love the tour of the house, my friend. Okay. Is, is that your sitting room, your living room, that room you just showed? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very on, uh, if, if I come back, if I come back on your show for another time for loads of other tales, I would I would do it in my in my in my uh, my video room, my, my media room. Oh, that'd be nice to see. That, 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 you see all my collections, about a part of my collection: laser discs, Blu-rays, CDs, <laughs> cassettes, okay. LPs, reel-to-reels, everything. You sound like me. <laughs> Yeah, I think everybody go. We've been we've been we've been hogging their time for too long. Yeah, they, thank they you were, so much for having me. I, I had a blast. It was my pleasure, my friend. You be well. You stay well, because you guys are under uh, you're under a lockdown currently right now. Don't do lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Can't go out. So, can't go. So you just got to stay in and keep doing what you're doing. Well, yeah. this was. A blessing to have you with us, John. You be well. Thanks for all the time. We just did about three hours and 10 minutes. Didn't and, feel uh, like it, right? It never feels like no, that. No, no, no. And now, now I'm going to go and cook, 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 cook my dinner. Yes. It's it's 11, uh, past 11. No, I'm just going to have a, have a oh, break. That's right. Yeah, it's about 6, 10 p.m. Eastern dinner time here. So after 11 there. So yeah, you yeah. go be well. And uh, thank you, my friend, for joining us here on the show. It was an honor and a pleasure. And you're welcome back anytime. Yeah, thank you. I, I look forward to that. Okay. You're yeah, welcome. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye now. Terrific guest, wouldn't you say? The legendary record producer, John Yap, owner of J Records. Again, jrecords.com if you want to find out about any of the incredible works. And he's going to be sending that song along and we'll play that closer to the 20th of January, which I think will be so apropos and so perfect. Again, you can hear a lot of the music and sample and check it all out at jrecords.com. Thanks everybody for joining us. Those of you on YouTube, we'd love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tomorrow, I wanna let you know as well, we've got an amazing guest, everybody excited, live from Athens, Greece. Mario Frangoulis is gonna be here. And he is a great friend. We have uh, known each other for a long time. I interviewed him on uh, public television, actually. Renowned Greek tenor Mario Frangoulis guests on the Gym Masters Show Live. That is tomorrow, Saturday, January 9th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern. It's a special earlier time for our show. 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern European time. So it'll be 8 p.m. in Athens, Greece, where 
Mario is. It's going to be, now this will be exclusively on our YouTube channel. So anybody watching on our Facebook page right now, make sure you go over to our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, definitely subscribe and make sure you log in tomorrow. So that way you can comment, ask questions and comment during the live show tomorrow. If you miss the show, it'll be completely archived for later viewing and binge watching on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. That is tomorrow. Then tomorrow in the evening, legendary billboard charting jazz and pop guitarist, musician, and award-winning composer. And he's going to perform live too. This is legendary Terry Wallman, responsible for so much music, network television music, theme songs to TV shows, documentaries, many commercials, and of course, lots of incredible music and working with legendary artists as well. He's a brilliant musician, guitarist, and legendary composer, Terry Wolman, live 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific tomorrow here on the Gym Masters Show Live. I want to also let you know that a week from tomorrow, on Saturday, January 16th, 2021, also live from Athens, Greece, another great friend, brilliant singer, George Paris is going to be here, French Greek singer. He's going to be live from Athens, Greece. That'll be at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, and 8 p.m. Eastern European time. That's 8 p.m., of course, those in that time zone in Greece. So that's exclusively as well on our YouTube channel at Gym Masters TV. And then live and direct, also from Europe, another very, very popular artist, Ireland's leading country music singer, Nathan Carter, who you might have seen uh, not that long ago on a public television special. Um, that's where we had an opportunity to meet and chat. He's terrific. He's going to be on the Gym Master Show live a week from this Sunday. That is January 17th, 2021. That show will be live on our YouTube channel exclusively, Gym Masters TV. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, and then the day of the show, log in so you can comment. 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, 8 p.m. in Ireland, Scotland, and England. So 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Nathan Carter, very, very popular. He's going to be here. Uh, that is a week from this coming Sunday. But on this Sunday, another brilliant singer, very popular. He's also going to sing live on the show. George Hutton is here this Sunday. Irish singer, songwriter, folk, and pop star on the Gym Master Show Live. That is this Sunday, January 10th, 2021. That's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, 8 p.m. GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. Bottom line, that means for folks watching right now in the Netherlands and Spain and France, as well as um, Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, it'll be 8 p.m. your time on Sunday evening. It'll be 3 p.m. here on the East Coast of the United States and Canada. And it'll be noon Pacific uh, for the folks on the West Coast of the uh, United States and Canada. So that's on our YouTube channel at Gym Masters TV. Uh, so just a preview of some of the folks coming up. And then on Monday, we've got another amazing guest. This is renowned and award-winning columnist, author, and speaker, Heather Dugan. She's going to be here live Monday. She's all excited. We can't wait to have her here. That'll be Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, live on the Gym Masters Show. That'll be on YouTube at Gym Masters TV, as well as also on our Facebook page, the fan page, Gym Masters TV. Then get ready to laugh on Tuesday. Yes, coming up on Tuesday, the incredibly funny comedian and actor, Josh Hyman is going to be here. Yes, Josh Hyman's going to be here for a lot of laughs. And I think we all need a lot of laughter uh, a lot of levity and a lot of levity about now. So Josh is all excited. There we are. <laughs> Josh is all excited. And Josh will be here this Tuesday live with lots of great stories, lots of uh, comedy. And Josh Hyman is going to be here 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. 
That's going to be coming up on Tuesday, this Tuesday. Again, if you want to see the album or get that album that uh, John Yap was referring to, there's your complete recording. Anyone Can Whistle is uh, the one that he was talking about, the latest release, which just came out in late November, which is very, very exciting. The complete recording uh, celebrating Stephen Sondheim's 90th birthday. And as you saw, you know, he, he's had a wonderful relationship with Stephen uh, Sondheim and uh, as well as many, many other incredible artists over the years. And uh, if you missed any of these photos, you can watch our show again and uh, really have an opportunity to, if you missed anything, learn more about uh, our wonderful guest, John. Yeah. Uh, he had great stories with all of these terrific photos that um, we shared here on the show. But uh, that is the album that is available along with a host of other albums he was telling us about decades worth of albums um, as well. And uh, you know how sometimes we always get a chance to see behind the scenes. We usually see an empty chair every once in a while. Well, you don't have an empty chair. You just have a lampshade and some pictures. So there you go. <laughs> sometimes we get a chance to see an empty chair. <laughs> this time we've got a lampshade with a lamp and some pictures at John's house. There you go. I know everybody laughs when they see that. Uh, sometimes it's an empty chair if a guest has to run out and then come back. Uh, again, I really like that photo with his mom back home in Malaysia and uh, in his youth. And uh, he just, uh, he had a vision, had a vision and uh, has pursued his dreams which is a beautiful story, very inspiring story, you know, when you think about it, for anybody that wants to uh, pursue their dreams, right? We talk about a lot of inspiration here on the Gym Master Show Live, and uh, it's a great story. Here at America, we would say, you know, living the American dream in a way, but you can do it no matter where you are around the world. If those opportunities are there, there's another great one. That's a great one, too. Love that one, too. There you are. <laughs> You're still there. Yeah. Hey, I was, we, we, I, didn't mention, I just, we, we didn't mention this photo, but it popped up. Tell us before you go about that one, because there's somebody we will certainly recognize. Well, that's the recording of, um, of um, the landing. You know? Right, and that's isn't that David Hyde Pierce? Yes. Yeah, David Hyde Pierce. Of course, everybody uh, knows. Julia, so Julia, Ma, Julia Moni, I think. Um, the girl. That's right. David Hyde Pierce. Yeah. Everybody knows from so many shows, but also from Frasier. Played Kelsey Grammer's yeah. brother in the TV series Frasier, and there he is. There, I'm glad that you were still there and you you popped back in because we had that uh, that photo. We didn't want to skip that photo uh, as no. well. Did you start your dinner? <laughs> No, no. So, I just packed up. Um, I just, I just packed up uh, the the room. I can show you the rest of the room now. Tonight. I got a bit more. I got a bit more. Um, oh, great! Bit more, uh, okay, I show you. I show you this angle um, of the piano. I can't. I don't know why I can't get it straight. It's very odd. I can't. I, I can't seem to get 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 it straight. Uh, okay. That's. Um, why can't I get it straight? Where's the bloody camera? That's 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 my my uh, portrait. Nineteen seventy seven. That's a nice chimney there. Okay. Very All right. You know, it's funny that maybe because you are in a perfectly proportioned house, it's so perfectly proportioned the video can't keep up with it. <laughs> so that's why you can't get it straight. 
The house is perfectly straight and proportioned, but maybe the video can't keep up with it. Great mm -hmm. rent over there. Uh, the neighborhood you're in, a beautiful area in London, I would imagine. Yes, uh, it is. It's, um, it used to be, um, I think it's still, the, I'm not sure, but uh, but used to be very arty. Um, yeah. Uh, very, very arty, lots of, lots of actors and directors and writers um, and um, live around here. I mean, I mean, there was a time when I was working with perfectly everybody that lived around me because I was doing various, like Josephine Barstow, she used to live just down the road here, but she no longer lives here. And um, and the director, uh, 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 me, the, the opera director that I, when I recorded uh, Orpheus, he was directing um, that production and he was the, um, living just down there and Sean Phillips and Sue Pollard, a, a great comedian, she lives just there, just across the road from here. I, I can see her window from here. So this used to be used to be a real uh, a lot of um, uh, actors and directors and administrators. Uh, Peter Jonas, who ran the e English National Opera, he just lived just there, but he he's, he he's no longer with us. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I love I love this area. I've been here for over 20, uh, 30 years. I think. Very, uh, very nice. I, I, I love this area, uh, but uh, of course, Islington. Um, this area is full of um, Georgian houses. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, for the ordinary uh, tourists and people visitors, unless you have people, uh, friends who live in this area, you won't come to this area uh, because it's all residential. But it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It's got most uh, a so, lot so of square. So if I come, you'll open the door, right? <laughs> London is full of squares, and this area has a lot of squares. You know what I mean by yeah. squares, don't you? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. But of course, of course, Upper Street, which is uh, which is my local, which is like about uh, about eight minutes, uh, seven minutes walk from here. There's a main street called Upper Street, but Upper Street has now become a big restaurant street. Loads and loads of wonderful restaurants are now lining the streets. And that is basically also a hub of fringe theater because we have about three or four fringe theaters along the street. Uh, one of which is the Almeida Theater, which is one of the world famous important fringe theater. Very nice, you know? very nice. Well, you go eat and you you enjoy the rest of your late night supper you'll be having. <laughs> and you take care, my friend. It was a pleasure. I have a nice sandwich. I have a nice sandwich. Peanut butter sandwich I'm gonna have. Okay. That's it. A, pe a, pe a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> yeah, Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> He's having a peanut butter sandwich. Now, for those of you foodies who love to know what everybody eats, now you can sleep easy tonight. Uh, the legendary record producer is having a peanut butter sandwich. Sometimes it's all about those constants in life, just the simple things in life, just the basic things in life, like a peanut butter sandwich. See, you can live in a beautiful Georgian house that's perfectly proportioned and a beautiful area of London. And just like everybody else, he wants a good peanut butter sandwich. That's authenticity. That's what life is all about, right? I bet you it's a really good peanut butter. <laughs> all right some closing comments and then I have to eat dinner too. And, and I hope you guys have been eating during the show because we started at 3 PM Eastern. So uh, we blew through lunch uh, and now it's dinner time. And then we've got an amazing show tomorrow coming up early 1 PM Eastern with uh, live from Athens, Greece, the incredible world renowned Mario Frangoulis. You're going to love it. Uh, and then two shows tomorrow. Again, Mario is at 1 p.m. Eastern, and then we're back at 7 p.m. Eastern with a billboard chart topping jazz and pop composer, musician, guitarist, Terry Wolman, and then George Hutton live from Ireland on Sunday. Uh, I told you we're going to kick off 2020 with some amazing shows, all different kinds of shows, different topics, different people and with all the levities watching around the world. Everything about today's show with John was fantastic. He's so very brilliant and many amazing stories and opportunities. And we're thankful for his contributions to all the many recordings, true levity. And again, if you wanna hear any of the music, cause of course he has lots of music, you can go to jrecords.com and you can sample a lot of it there. 
we wanted to have more of a conversation today and learn about his stories and look at the photos and everything. And then the music, maybe when he comes back, we'll do, we'll add in some more music as well. Uh, oh, food. I love peanut butter. And you had a peanut butter and red raspberry preserved tonight. And you love peanut butter. I love peanut butter too. I also sometimes just take the spoon and scoop it out of the jar. Sometimes I just take a spoon and scoop it out of the jar. <laughs> you do the same thing. Suzette in Portugal, thank you very much. Lots of uh, hugs to you as well. And yes, that was bonus time with uh, John. And uh, one more nice episode today, Jim. Uh, see you all next show. We'll be here tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern. See you tomorrow, Jim. Suzette, thank you. Musical theater, Sondheim by Alana was uh, the witch in his Into the Woods. Really, really nice. Uh, good night, Jim. Thanks for another. Good night, Jim. Thanks, as always, for another excellent episode. Good night, everyone. Please stay safe. Stay well. Time to go eat. Uh, was great. Thanks, Jim, from Juanita in uh, South Africa. Good night, everyone. Be good. Good night, Jim. Have a great night. Good night, all. Got to love, love it, right? Uh, Kathleen in New York City. Good night, friends. And Jim, Willie in Holland with us as well. You too, Willie. Mary Bishop in Florida. Good night, Jim and lovely friends. Have a wonderful evening. And um, Kathy Short in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Just finished cooking turkey, vegetable, chili. Ready to eat. Thanks, Jim. This was very entertaining. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Tomorrow, Suzette in Portugal says, tomorrow you will have great artist in person, Mario Argolis here. Yes, from Greece. And stay well, you as well. And stay safe. And Martin Dooley says, uh, no bore, fascinating and memorable conversation and stories. Thank you, Martin. Good to have you with us and I hope you watch uh, more often. And Merlin in Ontario, Canada. So enjoyed you, John, as well. And stay safe. And Kathleen in New York City, you too as well. And um, good stuff. Glad you guys all enjoyed it. Thanks for all the comments and participation. And uh, we love it. Yes. All right, gang. This is your host, Jim Masters. Thank you for your time this time. Till next time, we thank our very special artist, guest, extraordinaire, legendary record producer, John Yap, for joining us live from London, England. Again, he heads up J Records. And again, the Digimex that he's doing is extraordinary. A whole new revolutionary approach to... Uh, bringing incredible works back into our lives. Great guests coming up uh, throughout the weekend. So we hope to see you then. And uh, let's see, let's see. Maybe we will we'll share another one of our great guests. We had so many great guests and viewer, and we still are getting them in. If you still want to send us a video telling us why you love the Gym Masters show live, feel free to do that. Uh, we have so many of them that have been coming in, but uh, we'll share another one here, and we're going to do a whole show where we include all of the ones we had before and then some new ones that have come in since the holidays. Uh, it'll be a nice uh, host chat, fun show where the guests are celebrating what they love about the Gym Master Show Live and the viewers are. So if you haven't sent a video yet and you still would like to, you can send a video. It could be something quick on your phone or laptop, tablet. You can send it to gymmasterstv at gmail.com. That's gymmasterstv at gmail.com. And that'll be awesome. All right, we are going to wrap up. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Jim Masters saying... We love having you here. It's always a pleasure to have you here. We'll be back tomorrow on the Gym Master Show Live. Have a good night. Thanks for being with us. Mm -hmm.